quite a lot to investigate. We have different um, uh, 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 tracks that we, are, that we are uncovering all the time as we go through the files, but certainly the first track that we wanted to complete, we are on now, has been to the investigations committee already. So I think we've made uh, fair progress uh, on that with, 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 our, with our current power, powers. Um, again, yes, we agree with more oversight over, over, over corporations, but also the people that work at those corporations, uh, like the accountants, they mu there must be oversight over them. And again, we've seen SIPC coming out and being a lot more stronger on their oversight on corporations, and that really pleases us a lot. Um, Chairman Gordy, Cody talked about time frames and, and scope, saying that we uh, should have uh, been able to tell you today that at least in our investigation, this is what we're going to investigate and this is how long it's going to take us. And again, I apologize for not being able to do so. Um, if, we, if we had time to go through the files, the files that we normally receive are massive. It's com electronic files, we have to work through them, uh, delivered on Monday evening. Um, I apologize that we haven't had time to actually go through um, those files to be able to tell you today that this is the exact scope of our investigation and this is um, the, uh, uh, the time frames. However, because of everything that we do have from the public domain, we have a fair idea of what we are going to be looking for and that will of course be our, our next step. Um, and I think that also uh, responds to the question of why we had one slide on, 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 um, uh, on sign-off. I think that is where we are. Uh, we followed our process, the, the, when the story broke, we gave the order to 30 days to come back to us, they delivered the files, and unfortunately it's at this early stage not possible for us to give any, any further information. And when it comes to the investigation, I think the point was made that we also will have to be careful what we share uh, on the investigation itself so as not to compromise our process. Chair, if there's any uh, question that I might have omitted, the members could maybe just remind me, thank you. Honorable Manu. Mike is not uh, working. Yeah. Well, try the other one. Yeah. Try the other one. Is that better? Great. Uh, Chair, I put a, 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 I don't know if it's out of order, uh, I'm in your hands, but I put a, a question to Steinoff about whether they would be prepared to disclose uh, this very complex structure, including uh, all the entities and the underlying entities, the names of the directors, shareholders, and auditors. Everything off book, on book, everything. I think that one they'll respond as part of the package that they were given to deal with at a, at a later stage. Uh, let's let's conclude this specific one for now. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Chair. I, if uh, it's possible to do that, can you give us maybe the list of cases that they have investigated successfully and passed sanctions successfully? since their establishment, so that we, we, we check if the current framework is prohibitive enough to could discipline uh, the audit firms. And because you might find that some of these sanctions, it's like a fine of 15,000 rand, which to them is nothing compared to the millions of rands these audit firms get in fees from the companies that they So So we might need to be given the list of all the the cases that Erba has dealt with thus far and what were the sanctions and, and whether there was any impact uh, as a result of such sanctions. Thank you. Yeah, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, we, we publish that, that, that information quarterly, uh, but we will make sure that we get that um, information to Parliament as well. Uh, so um, I, I'm just going to hand over to the Chair to respond to some of the questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairs, and good afternoon to the members. Uh, as the Chair of IRBA, I'm sitting here since this morning, and I'm very much alive to the frustration and the sense of despair that the members have in this 
Chinese uh, regulators, including Erba, as having been uh, expressed now. And I'm pleased they are, they are raising this in this harsh manner and crude manner because it's got to sing to our executives. It actually echoes the, um, the statements that you continuously make in our board meeting ourselves to say the delays, the procedural manner, and all the constraints, as valid as they are, they all are like excuses when there is no output as expected. And it is upon us as IRWA, as one of the regulators, to manage and live up to these uh, expectations in as far as these high profile cases are concerned. And as recent as Monday, we had our board meeting and uh, we updated our own risk register. And top of that risk register now is the reputational risk to Erba and the reputational risk to the auditing profession at large that is imp imposed by this recent occurrence. And as the board, we demanded from management to put in place mitigating plans, which they duly submitted for that meeting in terms of the actions that they are going to be doing here forth. And the other matter which I, I feel I need to address, uh, particularly from the, from the auditing profession, um, there's been a lot of uh, shared sentiments here about collusion, collaboration between uh, the regulators, the auditors, and their clients. And we cannot discount that wholly, given what you've seen of recent days. Not being the first, we can go back to, to the decade and a half ago when the Enron uh, issue blew up. It was confirmed. It was this corroboration and this collusion. As regulator, we are very much aware of it. And when we conduct our own investigations, we take that into account. Yes, the question was raised as to what do we do uh, in terms of diving deep and interrogating such relationship. That is part and parcel of establishing where things went wrong in as far as this independence. I would like, I'm raising this point because, Chairs, I want to leave this committee uh, with the mindset of being assured that at least at IRBA, where I'm the chair of that uh, regulator, I can tell you unequivocally that the 10 of us who are the board members there are independent uh, CAs of the practicing firms. None of us is involved in any audit practice. None of us is a registered auditor. So we have no reason whatsoever not to be as objective and, and fair in dealing with these matters. All right. Therefore. Okay. I'm prodding you to round off. Thank you. As I'm rounding off, uh, I need to leave that assurance and then say to you, from here on, we're going to go back as the board of IRBA and impress upon our management team the reputational risk that we face if we don't prioritize and do deliver the outcome that are expected, particularly on these high profile monitors. We will submit the list uh, that has been requested by the member so that you can see the work that has been done on these numerous other cases. Thank you, Chairs. All right, uh, thanks very much. Um, let's, let's get down to work and, and see what the, the outcomes will be. Well, comrades, we on the last uh, segment of our program. Yes? Chair, I put a question to Steinhoff uh, through you. They haven't uh, had an opportunity to reply. I thought uh, Comrade Matale said the information that you are requesting will come uh, later as part and parcel of some of the other things that uh, some of the other information that we'll get. 
but it is limited. Uh, Chair, with respect, I'm delighted that the chairperson has given an undertaking, uh, but we have no such undertaking from uh, Steinhardt. I'm very happy to address that. Thank you, Chairs. There's, uh, again, just to sketch the context, there's some 30 countries in which we operate. The laws are differently in all of those countries. I cannot sit here and tell you that I know what the laws of all those countries are. So insofar as we are legally in a position to do so, to give you a list of the companies, list of the directors, and who the auditors of all the underlying companies are, very happy to do that. I know in South Africa that's not a concern. The, 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 the list of the companies and directors are public records, so we're happy to give that. As far as the question relates to who the auditors of some of the offshore entities were, is that Deloitte was not the auditor of all these entities. So there were also other entities, in, other, audit of, other audit firms involved, sorry. As I sit here, I cannot recall all of their names. So that, again, to the extent that we are in a position legally to do so, glad to make that information available. And again, it, it's the, the, the message that we did this morning. It's part of the PwC scope to investigate all of those things and address those concerns that were raised by the honorable members to the extent that there were alleged cozy relationships and those type of things. That is the most definitely something that's of extreme importance for us as a management team that will form part to that, that that is uncovered. I hope that addresses the concerns. All right, okay, that's fine. Uh, Shalom. Th that, that's fine, I think that let us get that written submission, but also a submission of all the companies that provide professional services to stay up, or so-called professional services, because that is where the payments, for instance, to Campion Capital, comes from way. So I think that that will even do justice to this to say how much money does a, a stain of pay to companies that help it with professional services and, and where are those companies based so that we're able to, to then deal with this track. I'm sure because it's companies that are leading with them, they will have immediate information and then provide that to us. Is it your hand up? Chair, just to, to th uh, Chair, just to, just to, just to thank uh, Steinhoff for making that commitment, uh, because I suspect uh, that what we'll find is that many of those uh, off-book uh, entities are audited by small boutique right. uh, law uh, audit firms, okay. and that that no, that's uh, enabled some of the fraud. No, that's okay. We'll we'll see when the when the list come. Uh, well, comrades, let's uh, give the uh, GPF and the PIC uh, to make their presentations, and only after both of them have presented can we make interventions. Uh, Colonel Chair, can I just raise one practical thing? Uh, well, firstly, uh, I'd just like to agree with Comrade Castle, right? When we said the legislation should come, it's not at the expense of doing more now. There's no excuse. Bernard also says so, no excuse, right? Oh, Bernard's listening, but fine. Secondly, uh, Bernard, uh, just to make clear, when we said the regulations and the amendments to the legislation should come, we're not saying, therefore, you fold your arms, obviously. We want you to be decisive. We think we can do more, and I think everybody's saying that. But the second thing is a practical thing. I'm part of a, a, a teleconference with nine other people, which was planned three weeks ago. And so the comrade chairs have excused me for the next half an hour and Mr. Mania will be delighted. Thank you. So I I'm am, I hope it's longer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, GEPF. Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, I'm Dries De Witt, the Vice Chairperson of the Board of Trustees of the GEPF. Uh, Chair, I also want to table apologies for the Chairperson, uh, Dr. Ranoshi Mukate, who can't be here today, and she tabled her apology. Honorable Chair, uh, Mr. Abel's at all able to do the presentation, but I wanted to make a few open remarks to put the GPF in perspective. There's a 430,000 pensioners that get every month pension from the GPF. If you take the extended family into consideration, it's well over a million members 
that receive their pension or lift from the GPF. So the GPF is a sans substantial role player in the South African economy. And it's those pensioners that buy also from the shops of Steinhoff uh, every month uh, when they buy their groceries, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> uh, Chair, we have 1.2 million active members and the asset base, 1.7 trillion rand. Uh, the honorable members indicated this morning that when we talk about a 20 billion rand loss or devaluation in the fund, it's a lot of money. Yes, Chair, it is a lot of money. And it's a huge concern for the GPF Board of Trustees. But when you tell the active members and the pensioners there's a loss of 20 billion, you can create havoc amongst those members because they do not understand really what the 20 billion means. But when you explain it's about 1% of assets, then there's a better understanding. So yes, we must keep that also in perspective. To give you another example, in the downturn of the economy in 2008-9, the GPF assets went down by 94 billion rand, 94 billion rand. The next year, after the downturn in the economy, due to markets moving up quite nicely, it kicked back with 180 billion rand the next year. And those information are available in the annual reports of the GPF. Chairperson, uh, the GPF, the Board of Trustees and the management put in place substantial measures. Asset liability model we put in place to make sure that we put in place what we called also a reserve to counter things like market volatility when there's a downturn in the markets. And with the last actuarial report of 2016, the funding level of the GPF was 115%, which means that it can honor all its commitments. And the message that we sent out also through media statements after the turndown in the economy to men's pensioners and members is that the GPF can honor all its commitments in terms of the benefits promised in the rules of the GPF, including the pension increase that's due in April 2018, <coughs> due to a funding position that's over 100%. But that does not mean we must continue like that and observe or, or, or absorb losses like the Steinhoff losses, and we are concerned and we believe strongly that those who play a role in this process must be brought to task in terms of such losses. Because the last thing that the GPF want to do is to put an extra burden on the fiscus by asking for extra contribution in order to keep the current funding level where it should be and to honor its promise in terms of the rules in paying the benefits to the 430,000 pensioners and also the benefit due in time to come to the 1.2 million members. Chair, that in short, as, as an introduction, Mr. Abel Sotole will now take you through a few slides. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and the chairs of uh, the, the committee's meeting. Um, I have here, my, my, my colleagues as well, not just myself, I think the, the, the deputy chair or vice chair of the board has spoken and apologized on behalf of the chair. I have the head of corporate services, Mr. Musama Besa, Ms. Linda Mateza, who heads investments and actuarial, and Mr. Babs Naidu, who heads stakeholder relations, and Ms. Van Nierkerk, who is our company secretary, uh, also here with me. Um, just to go uh, quickly, I, 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 I don't have a lot of slides to share, and that is not an indication of um, things have not having happened because a lot has happened. I want to focus by and large on the last uh, uh, two bullet points of that slide because most of the other things you've heard during the course of the day, so there's no point in repeating 
uh, what has transpired and triggered um, the, the, the reason why we are here today and the reason why you wanted the G GPF to come and account. Um, the, the important thing to, 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 to indicate is that the value of uh, the GPF shareholding in, in Steinhoff depreciated and with an emphasis on, of, on the depreciation and, and sometimes it sounds like semantics but it's quite important and it alludes to something that the chair has indicated. At this point in time, the losses have not been realized, therefore we do not speak about losses um, uh, as such, but we speak about a depreciation because that's what it is. And, and, and that's quite important as well to contextualize how we as an investor respond and maybe gives context to some, um, uh, uh, some of the issues that the committee might have been maybe are not comfortable with in terms of how people have responded because a lot of what is being said here or how we are responding as shareholders or people who hold people to account actually has a major, major impact on what this depreciation is about and uh, its extent and how long it can be. Of course, that does not absolve the, the, the reason why in, in the final analysis that this has happened and, and, and the reason why the committees are here to hold uh, both ourselves, uh, the regulators and Steinhoff to account. But we need to appreciate that these losses at this point in time are really uh, book losses. And I will deal with it in the next slide in terms of how that has impacted on the GPF. Now, I'm aware that um, you probably will struggle to read the slide, but it's been provided to you. The slide tells a, a number of stories and, and a number of key messages um, that are quite significant. We've done it in, in both ways. We've, we've shown um, the value amounts because it's important that the, the, the committees are aware in terms of what the extent in, in quantum of the investment that the, 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 the GPF had um, uh, on Steinhoff and what the impact uh, of what we are talking about today has had so far. And of course, that has not been a static thing. So it, it is a moving target as, as we speak. So that's the first thing. Uh, and then of course, to show the percentage, I think that the, the quantum um, kind of uh, emphasizes what the committee uh, and, and honorable committee, committee members have stated. We, we need to acknowledge that the amounts that are involved are quite significant and there's no doubt about that. Um, uh, uh, talking about uh, 20, uh, or 18, 20 billion, is, is, those are not small, small amounts of money. And pensioners normally w w remind me of the fact that your average pension that a, a GPF pensioner gets is, is, is a matter of a couple of thousands on average. And therefore speaking about billions, you always have to translate that to what does it mean for a pensioner. But of course, as an, as an investor and a custodian, you can't be fixated on that because you have to look at the bigger picture um, and look at it in terms of what is the impact that it has on the fund overall. Why is that important? Because as the gen general has indicated, the same message can be understood very differently by different constituencies of the GEPF. Uh, when members hear that you've left 27 billion, to them it might mean that you won't be able to pay my pension. Well, that's not true. And I think we, we need to be very, very ca careful that when we, we talk about these losses, we recognize the extent of it, but also be Mr. able and be in a position to communicate. Why, why, why not give us the presentation? And then we can argue and debate the merits and the demerits and the issues later. Okay, so, so but I think it's, it's the message that that slide contains. It's that it, it tells two messages. The one says the quantum is big. The other one is that the impact on the member in terms of the, rec the receiving benefits actually is a different story. So actually that is the message. Uh, it's just that I'm, 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 I'm putting it in numbers. So th that's quite significant. So what, no, I, I want to go back to the slide. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the slide tells you a number of things. It, it shows you the extent of which we, we, we the, the, the market value of the assets depreciated um, from the 30th of November to where it currently is. What you will notice that there was a significant depreciation followed by slight recovery. And, and I think that's where it's important that we understand that there's still a potential to recover as and when we actually understand the extent of what has happened and of course action is taken uh, in that regard. That, that's, that's, that, that's, that, that's the important message. And then of course the, 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 the one thing that is something that we, we don't say quite often is that we don't talk about the fact that the price um, at the time of uh, depreciation was actually an aggregation of us purchasing at different levels. So it doesn't really tell the whole story because you might find that although there's been a significant uh, depreciation, it is not the true reflection of all the assets at, at, at the different times at which we bought it, just to, to say that in passing. Next. 
then of course uh, the, 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 the Lancaster, uh, and, and there we, 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 it was mentioned, so we, we do dwell on that because the loss is not only the loss directly to, to well, not, not the loss, the depreciation to the GPF, but the impact that it has on some of the entities that, that, that we funded in, in specifically uh, Lancaster. Lancaster is probably in the same situation as other investors in terms of how that has affected them going forward, but the, the, the PIC will probably spend a lot more time talking about um, the Lancaster transaction. Then the impact on the GPF, I think the numbers I've already indicated, uh, at the depth of the crisis, uh, the GPF had 415 million shares, uh, valued at about 2.5 billion. The share price continues to be volatile as the company seeks solutions and the market awaits the outcome of the investigation in terms of, uh, well, we say accounting fraud. It's actually alleged accounting fraud. We don't know at this point in time what actually has happened, and I think we will be able to only say uh, finally, what has happened and when that has been um, um, uh, concluded. Um, the, 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 the important thing that we need to, 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 to say about that is that the 415 million shares uh, you would have seen in the, in, 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 in the slide where I showed you the table of the movement that um, there has not been a significant change in the GPF shareholding of uh, Steinhoff. Uh, that was, it's not an accident, uh, the, 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 the investment committee of the GPF met on the 18th of December, uh, engaged with the PIC and a view, a decision was taken that we will actually continue to hold um, uh, our shares in Steinhoff uh, with uh, an, a, an expectation that once the matter settled down, uh, the truth is known and the extent to which things have happened, um, that things are probably not going to be, um, uh, we hope, uh, as bad as the, 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 the market seems to indicate and that there will be re recovery. Uh, earlier there was a question asked about w what, is the ex what is the value of, of Steinhoff at, at this point in time. It's of course difficult to, to, to give a conclusive answer, but the indications from different analysts is that there may very well be significant value that still actually resides in Steinhoff and therefore there is the potential that the, the current share price will recover and therefore reflect a different uh, value of the total assets that the GPF holds. Interventions by the GPF and the PIC, um, uh, we, we, we communicated to the market uh, in the first instance, our stock stakeholders being members and pensioners, and then again, making sure that we communicate both messages, the extent to which the assets have depreciated, but also to give them uh, some, uh, the correct assurance that um, the, the fact that there's been this significant uh, uh, depreciation, the value of uh, a single share, does not actually impact their benefits uh, that they will be receiving henceforth. Uh, of course, you as the representative of the, of the fiscals in the long term, you will be concerned if this was, were to become uh, an, a regular occurrence with the most of the funds investments. As I've indicated, the special investment committee was held, a decision was taken not to uh, 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 change our shareholding in, in, in Steinhoff. Um, and I think we're, we're hoping that in time this decision will be vindicated by a significant appreciation in the share price and therefore uh, a true or a better reflection of the value uh, that the, current, the, the GPF is holding in, 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 in Steinhoff. Uh, it was agreed that the PIC on behalf of the GPF will address the corporate governance shortcomings with Steinhoff and that the investigation must be credible, transparent, and of course in, in, in involve the PIC um, uh, in an observer stated something that I, I has happened, but I think I will leave that to the PIC to address uh, when they present. Again, just to indicate that the, the GPF and, and the PIC have not been sitting back to let matters just uh, transpire. Um, it, it, it is important to understand um, the GPF's approach to uh, this investment and what has happened with it and, and in, in, in the context of how the GPF uh, is now addressing it, its, its investments in totality. Um, the GPF, of course, is committed to uh, responsible investing and is a founding member of the United Nations Principles on, on Responsible Investing. And, uh, and, and there is, is, is about actually becoming um, uh, an active uh, shareholder uh, and, and wanting to invest in entities that uh, share our values. Um, and of course, that doesn't mean that we make decisions overnight. We don't switch the button on and off. We actually engage over a period of time, but actually con convey what we believe um, are the kind of uh, values that we expect the investing companies uh, needs to have, including uh, companies such, such, as, such as Steinhoff. 
uh, one of the fund's um, uh, 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 key investment beliefs, when we came to speak to uh, the Standing Committee on Finance, we actually indicated that we, we, we have approved a new policy in terms of the investment beliefs of the GEPF, um, which addresses as one of our, uh, our major beliefs uh, that uh, we, we pay attention to uh, what is generally known as ESG, the environment, the, so the social environment, and the governance issues. Uh, and some of those governance issues were addressed earlier on by when questions were asked about how can you have a, uh, a, a company auditing a firm beyond a certain number of uh, years, and those are the kind of issues that we're starting to pay attention to. But it goes beyond that because governance tended to be uh, kind of a tick box looking at proxies and focusing on those, but to go beyond that to look at issues of uh, uh, of social, the issues of uh, the values of organizations, and of course the broader issues of, of the environment. Uh, the Steinhoff events highlighted the importance of corporate governance um, at the funds investing companies. Um, again, it, 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 as some committee members have indicated, it, it, we currently are focused on Steinhoff, and that, that is correct, but we as a GPF, of course, look are looking at uh, are all the investee companies that we're looking at, and of course using this as a lesson of some of the questions and the uh, uh, difficult engagements that we need to have with investee companies. Uh, the fund remains committed to applying its responsible investing uh, policy to promote good governance. I think that uh, stands to, to reason, and the GPF is, uh, is required. And this is quite important because uh, somebody indicated that one of the challenges of, of a fund like the GEPF is that we constitute a significant investor in the domestic market and our shareholding in companies um, is, is both a, re a reflection of our belief that as a South African uh, significant investor, we need to invest in our, in, our, in, in our economy in a number of ways. Of course, one of the uh, most um, standard and secure ways is to invest through the, exchange, uh, the stock exchange, and there are other ways that we can actually invest in the African environment. But it, it does speak to the fact that we invest because we have no choice but to invest in, 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 in the market. And, and it is important to be aware that at this point in time, uh, over 90% of our assets are actually invested in the do domestic market. Now, I'm not saying that to indicate that it's a bad thing. Uh, historically, it has served the GPF very well that we have had this exposure. But of course, if you are in, in, in the sphere of investment, um, uh, somebody spoke about you need to diversify through to in, into different asset classes and, and, and different entities within asset classes. Uh, for an entity like the GPF, one of the major significant consideration is um, the, 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 the need to diversify from um, uh, our exposure to All right. our own market. Okay, that's fine. I think that's a policy matter for SCOF. Yeah. They, <laughs> they will note it. <laughs> so that is, a, that is a policy matter. I think yeah. that, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm kind of drilling on it because this is one area where the, the committee and other committees within uh, this environment can actually address that we need to look at. Actually, that is my last slide, Chair. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, PIC. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, Co-Chairs. Uh, and good afternoon, parliamentarian and colleagues this side of the room. My name is Tolanem Kwanazi. I'm accompanying the PIC delegation. I first must start by apologizing for the chairman, uh, Mr. Telezi, who is uh, attending the cabinet Lehutla, uh, could therefore not make it and uh, left this task to the able hands of myself and the team. Um, I'm accompanied by Dr. Daniel Machila, the chief executive, who is here with his top executives uh, including the head of uh, investments in listed entities, as this was, and, uh, uh, he and his colleagues. We've been to this committee before. Uh, PIC is well known. We are the biggest uh, asset uh, manager in the continent, uh, managing uh, in excess of $2 trillion. Rands of, of funds uh, in, in the market. We do that within a mandate passed on to us by GEPF, and we continuously work 
uh, closely with GPF uh, on a dynamic contact sharing nodes as we go along. We pride ourselves of being rigorous in doing this job and we've consistently exceeded the mandate targets of a considerable number of years. Steinhoff is one of the top 10 companies on our listed JSC stock, a blue chip company by all definitions prior to the debacle. And therefore, also, we had significant investments in Steinhoff. Uh, much of what we also have to say has just been said by the GPF team. We will uh, present, uh, Dr. Majila will present our side of the story, particularly uh, addressing those uh, general questions the chair spoke about. Uh, such as the extent of the damage, what did we do to limit, what have we learned, and what are we doing going forward. Uh, there you are, Dr. Machila. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairpersons, and thank you, uh, Deputy Chairman of the PIC, for, for the introduction. We are now regular visitors to, to Parliament, maybe Parliament must consider giving us real uh, access card as opposed to <laughs> these pieces of papers. <laughs> but Chairman, on a serious note, uh, we've seen a number of uh, corporate scandals in the recent months, uh, especially in the state on entities, governance issues has been publicized a lot. There are inquiries that are happening here. And uh, in December we saw Steinhoff. And it was a reminder to us that corporate scandals are not confined to state on entities only. Even the best can get involved in those kind of things. And therefore, for a biggest investor like the PIC, on behalf of its clients, means that we, start, we have to start thinking about better ways of uh, improving our investment process, and most importantly, working with authorities to see how much we can uh, improve on our policies as well as legislation to try and minimize or even avoid this kind of things from happening. Steinhoff in particular, in the bigger scheme of the GPF portfolio, may look small. And uh, we have spoken about the size of the loss in absolute terms, billions of rents. And all of this probably caused by governance lapses from where we can see. I think the biggest fear for us is what if it's not Steinhoff alone? What if, two, if it's two or three companies at more or less the same time? Then we will have a serious problem in terms of the responsibility that the GPF has to carry of ensuring that it meets its liabilities to the clients when they, to their members when they retire. Because the portfolio will shrink. And therefore it requires us to quickly deal with this problem, nip it in the bud if we can, in the best interest of all investors and most importantly, uh, investors will have more confidence in investing on the JSC, hopefully. Because right now, I think uh, that confidence is a little bit dented, you know, uh, because of the losses that we've seen. But Chairperson, the, G, uh, the PIC, as uh, uh, the Deputy Chairperson of the PIC has said, is the asset manager of government employees, pension fund, and the other clients owned by the government of South Africa. 
we operate on the basis of client mandates from our clients, including the GPF, which specifies in clear terms investment parameters that includes sectors in which we have to invest in, where do we invest in the balance sheet of companies, in other words, equity, bonds, uh, money markets, and so on, and risk parameters that are spelled out in the mandate that says you can't deviate by this much, and so on and so forth. So our responsibility is to implement this line mandates on behalf of our clients. And of course, we have responsibility as well to make sure that we outperform these mandates or these uh, mandate parameters as far as possible so that we can create wealth and therefore cover the liabilities when they are due comfortably. So Chair, the next slide is just a snapshot of what the client has mandated us, us to do with their listed portfolio, the GPF here. So the GPF mandate says we must invest about 45 to 55% of the portfolio into listed shares on the JSC. And the risk parameters are that we should be within what we call a tracking error limit of about 1.5%. In other words, the portfolio must not vary too much from the benchmark. If the tracking error is zero, it means you are hugging the benchmark perfectly. Now, one and a half gives you small scope to move, probably add value through sector allocation, and it takes care of possible market movements and so on as you trade, so that uh, you know this trading activity, on average, you still remain within this trading error band. That's what the client has uh, prescribed for us. Now, the client has prescribed the FTSE JSC shareholder weighted index excluding gaming and gambling stocks and real estate as a benchmark. That benchmark creates a structure of the portfolio automatically. There's a, there's a certain implied structure. In other words, a certain amount of stock that we need to hold in the whole of the benchmark so that we are within the tracking error limits. If you look at the next page, there's more decomposition of the previous mandate at high level now, it specify the different mandate within the equity portfolio. It says 80% of the portfolio or 70 to 100% of the portfolio must be in passive, passive uh, mandate. In other words, we have to hug the benchmark, which is the six index, and the variation is even tighter now. We only have to move 0.5, or minus 0.5 within those bands in terms of variability of the returns of the portfolio versus the actual benchmark returns. So it's very tight, it's even constrained us further in terms of the kind of stocks that we hold. Now, if you move to the next day, uh, page, it, we've taken a snapshot of the benchmark, the top 10 companies. There are other 160 companies, you know, or 150 or so, in addition to the top 10 that you see there, and you see Steinhoff is occupying the fifth position, and this was done on the 30th of June, 2016. So in other words, uh, before, before the crisis, long before the crisis. So you can see it's, the top, it's in the top five. Steinhoff is in the top five. This position hasn't changed much even last year. It would have been uh, in the top 10 for probably even the last five, six years or so. So, which means that if you look at the benchmark weight of 4.2% or so, means that if you are going to invest a trillion rands, which is the size of the equity portfolio of the GPF, it means that 4.2% of that should, more or less 4.2% of that should be in stand of, roughly you're talking about 420 billion or so, no, uh, sorry, 42 billion or so. so the mandate structure forces us to hold a certain amount of stand of shares so that we don't uh, breach the mandate. I think what the 
committee needs to uh, pay attention to as well is NASPES at the top there, which is 18.6 weight in the benchmark. It's a scary number. You know, it tells you that the benchmark is not so diversified. If we were to have a crisis like this one, it would make, uh, you know, sign of crisis look like nothing, you know. So, Chairperson, this is the mandate. We are, we are, we are, we are being instructed to put money into uh, the switch and with the, those risk parameters. Now, how have, has the portfolio performed? If you look at the size of the portfolio, as at the 31st of March, 2017, it was 1.6 billion, 1.6 trillion, or 1 1,677, oh my gosh, 1.6 trillion. <laughs> <laughs> On the 5th of December, it was 1.8 trillion. So, which means there was value add of about 107, 100, 173 billion rands. 173 billion rands of wealth created over that period. So the portfolio was up, up, up about 10.37%. Yes. So the portfolio on the 31st of March was... So, sorry, CEO, I, I, do you have the slide in front of you? Yeah, because it can also help. Sorry, Chair. Page 7. Page 7 of the slide. It's, it's, yeah, my it's, eyes are uh, so. I just want to hear. Oh, I see. Music to hear. You can just repeat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, but I feel like I'm not, on uh, idols. But. Uh, Honorable Lusuma, <laughs> if you can also assist her so that she can see where we are. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Honorable Member, on the 31st of March 2017, the portfolio was worth 1.677 trillion rands. On the 5th of the, uh, December, its market value was 1.85 trillion rands representing growth of about 173.9 billion rands. This is a 10% increase, in other words, in the value of the portfolio. Post the crisis, the market was very strong up to January. I guess I'm told it has to do a little bit with the, the December conference, you know, but the fact of the matter is, you know, the market performed very well on the 19th of Jan, the portfolio was worth 2.045 trillion rands, representing 193 billion uh, versus the 31st of, of March 2017. So the impact of uh, the Steinhoff um, um, collapse has been minimal on the portfolio, but it's significant in rent terms. And as I said before, is the responsibility of ourselves and other investors to make sure that we deal with these corporate governance issues, policies, so that we can tighten in such a way that we don't have this kind of scandal happening on a big scale because it can harm the portfolio uh, value and therefore the uh, promise that uh, the client has made to its uh, uh, members. Steinhoff in particular, we've shown the numbers there. On the 31st of March, it was 27 billion worth. Uh, on the 5th of December, it fell to 19 billion, a loss of 8 billion, and a further loss of 16 billion, closing at uh, 2.9 billion rents in our books. This has been a significant loss indeed. Chair, in terms of mandate compliance, you will see on page eight that uh, we, we have been well within the mandate parameters. We spoke about one and a half percent of tracking error. You see the current tracking error there as 1.30. And uh, in December, on the 5th of December, it was uh, almost 1.1%. So we've been within 
the uh, client mandate parameters. Uh, I think the most important uh, uh, other issue that I want to highlight is that on the 30th of June 2016, we were underweight, Steinoff actually. In other words, we held a lesser amount relative to what the mandate uh, uh, prescribed. And uh, I, will, I will explain later, you know, the Lancaster transaction, how it fits into this. Or maybe let me right away say, because we are underweight, and if you look at our investment philosophy as a PIS, it says we want to invest in companies that generate sustainable returns, and most importantly, that embrace environmental, social, and governance issues for sustainability. Steinoff, if you look at performance before the crisis, it has generated almost uh, more than 20% of compound annual growth in the past 10 years or so before the crisis. So in terms of portfolio growth, it has delivered. We've measured their governance. Uh, our rating was about 55. We'll take you through the details of why we arrived at the number 55. If you look at the board, you know, although not so diversified, these are some of the things that makes it 55. It's because of diversity and many other things that go with it. But in terms of the body of knowledge of the director that's sitting on that company, we think it ranks very high. We've got the best, um, probably the best brains sitting on that board of, um, of um, directors of, of Steinhoff. So governance issues, average, Performance has been good, so being underweight was not such a great strategy, especially when they moved to Europe uh, with um, the strategy of growing the company aggressively, because they said to us they need more liquidity, more depth market, uh, markets and so on, so that they can raise cash and expand. And we bought into that story, although we did not support the listing on the Frankfurt Exchange. We did not support it, but uh, we lost to the democratic process of voting and so on. Other shareholders liked it, so that's why they listed on the uh, Frankfurt Stock Exchange and became a Dutch company. So we had to close our position slightly. Now, an opportunity came from Mr. Jayendra Naidu, who negotiated a 2.75% equity position in Steinhoff. And so we took that, you know, we saw an opportunity to use that to close our position, our underweight position in Steinhoff. You can see that on page eight, again, that on the 31st of December, of October, post the Lancaster transaction, the trading error had moved closer to uh, active weight has moved closer to, to zero, minus 0 0.03, a very small underweight post the Lancaster transaction. So that puts us very close to the benchmark and therefore eliminated, eliminated potential risk of underperformance if this stock was going to grow as fast as it was anticipated. So that brings us to the reason for the Lancaster transaction. We saw this opportunity to close our active position and most importantly, we saw an opportunity to drive transformation through this 2.75%. So we created a BSPV, uh, which is Lancaster 101, where GPF owns 50%. 25% is owned by Mr. Uh, a, a group led by uh, Jayendra Naidu. And the other 25% is earmarked for broad-based groupings that are playing in the retail space that are suppliers uh, uh, designed to do enterprise development, uh, uh, development in, the, in the retail space. That is work in progress. Those are some of the, the KPIs that we've demanded or prescribed to Lancaster you know, as part of the funding that they go drive transformation in the retail space. It's still work in progress. In addition to that, because we took uh, the 
active position from 10 basis points right up to three basis points with additional uh, purchase of 2.75, we felt it was prudent that we also hedge the position. In other words, if we are wrong, we can be protected on the downside. So we put hedges around this 2.75 position through a derivative structure that we did with one of the big banks, city banks for that matter. So in a situation where we felt we may be wrong, if the share price falls, we know that our capital will be provided and pro protected. If the share price runs, we will participate in the growth of the share price up to a certain point because we sold what we call a zero cost call to finance the insurance that we are paying. We had to sell a little bit of upside uh, to end up with a, a zero cost cost structure. And at the same time in 27, May 2017, we then improved the structure further after the star was born. Uh, I think it was explained in the morning, the new uh, uh, Steinhoff uh, Africa Retail, which houses mostly the businesses of Steinhoff as well as ShopRite in the rest of the continent. We created Star in that way. Because it had companies that are very solid, that are very clean, we felt that we should move the, some of the structure into that new vehicle. And this has further uh, improved on the risk profile of the original structure of 9.75 billion rands, Chair. So, Chair, this is uh, where we are in terms of the mandate compliance as well as the B transaction in Lancaster. Unfortunately, we can't divulge the actual detail of the zero structure that we've put in place because obviously it's market sensitive. The, the bank has to hedge itself on an ongoing basis, you know, and if we have, uh, you know, players such as Viceroy, you may find yourself in a bit of a situation if you don't know what you're doing. Chair, the issue of what happened, I think was belabored quite extensively in the morning. We know by and large what has happened and uh, it was adequately covered uh, in the morning. And so, We can move to slide 17. I think we, we again, uh, slide 14, we, we have, uh, you know, talked to that, the losses. Uh, we just want to show that is the amount of losses now is close to 12 billion. Now, the share price fell from 45, 65 to about seven rand, more or less. Smart institutions have made money out of this by shorting the stock, obviously, you know. And, 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 and I guess Viceroy is one of those. If probably I can take this opportunity to explain quickly to the, to the members what, what this, this entails. So an investor that feels that the stock price is going to fall, like Stanoff in this case, if they have uh, you know, perfect foresight, they will then borrow shares in the market from other players. Let's say they borrow from whoever at 45.95 share price. They borrow those shares and then they sell them immediately in the market for 45. 65. They compensate the lender by paying 2%, 1%, that sort of number. It really depends on demand and supply. <clears throat> when the stock price falls, they make money. And this is what happened with Steinhoff. It went as low as four rents. Maybe they probably closed their position at four rents. And then they give back the lender their script at four rents, a worthless script at four rents. You know, so the activity of script lending may have to be looked at carefully by the regulators, whether it's something that really helps to create wealth 
or is just something that destroys wealth? If it creates wealth, it's going to be benefit those who are shorting the stock and not necessarily the bigger economy, quite frankly. Because most of the players like ourselves are long-term investors. We take position in the long term. We never short stocks in the long term because we expect them to recover through cycles. So this is one of the things that we probably have to you know, request the, 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 the regulators, the JAC, to look at this thing and see if they cannot regulate you know, the script lending activity and shorting of stocks and so on, especially if it's for speculative purposes as opposed to you know, uh, enhancing or facilitating you know, certain strategic uh, uh, transactions. So we, those who made money out of this are those who have sh taken short positions. But Chair, the and again, the message that we want to uh, um, uh, convey out there is that from the PIC, we don't believe that Steinhoff is necessarily worth zero. It's got some nice underlying assets. They were able to sell some PSG to partly deal with their liquidity issues. There are properties worth 3.8 million euros, cap, and so on. Now, we have to wait, obviously, for the PwC investigation. We have to wait for the financial statements uh, so that uh, we are able to assess whether, indeed, there is still some value left in the company. We can only pray that this happens quickly so we can uh, pick up the pieces and, and move on. So we are not exiting yet uh, as the PIC. We will wait for the uh, investigations to unfold. So Chair, uh, I'm going to stop there uh, and ask my colleague to take you through you know, what we've uh, learned out of this thing and the governance recommendations that we're gonna make and, and other recommendations that we believe authorities, regulators, may have, take, have to take into consideration in uh, improving the uh, regulations and policies to protect investors like ourselves and the small men in the street that have put a little bit of their pension at risk on the JSC. Rubina? Apologies, Chairperson, our battery has just died. We're trying to get uh, another computer. Well, we have why, uh, why, why, uh, consulted. No, 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 just hang on. Why, okay. why, why don't you talk us through, because I would imagine most, if not all of, all of us decide to have your copies, so we're not entirely dependent Thank you, Dr. Dan, right. and good afternoon to the committee. Thank you. My apologies for the delay. So following the debacle, we looked at some of the governance gaps and identified areas that perhaps we could close going forward. And um, some of these would include a need for a structure or forum that enables and formalizes shareholder activism in an in a inclusive manner that not only relies on um, the larger institutional shareholders, but actually includes the individual shareholders who, and gives them a voice to engage in all matters going forward. I think the structure and the form in which this forum is to, to take is something we still need to consider. Um, as shareholders, we also need to emphasize and demand greater transparency and disclosure, particularly where there are, it's a complex group structure, which could increase the probability for accounting irregularities and tax evasion. We need to demand greater disclosure of all off-balance sheet transactions as well as design or insert a mechanism that requires shareholder approval for such tran transactions by entities when they do contemplate um, such transactions. We also need to contemplate regulation to limit the powers of the rights of individuals with excessive influence in the operations of companies. Um, as well as the regulation of holding dual or multiple strate strategic positions within an organization that would allow one to actually um, create opportunities that would hinder disclosure or the detection of irregularities when they do occur. We also need to consider 
the immediate suspension of key executives um, when there is a, a, a disclosure by an entity of fraud or, or alleged fraud to protect the interest of shareholders. Um, the, when it comes to auditor rotation, the PIC's position is always is, is that it should occur after every 10 years, and this must happen at all levels of the group, at every entity level within the organization. The timing, however, does not necessarily have to be synchronized. The regulation of director tenureship is something that we do think has to also be regulated, so to make sure that the independence of directors are not comp compromised at any point. If we go to the next slide, the top right hand block in orange, um, this, the block, this block reflects the Stein of AGM resolutions which were voted against by the PIC during the last three years. We voted against uh, the movement of the primary listing Frankfurt as mentioned by Dr. Dan, because as a principle, the PIC prefers domestic listings, particularly where majority of the assets and the revenues have been derived in South Africa. Um, we also voted against the appointment of two members as members of the supervisory board, largely because we questioned their independence given their long board tenures, which was both 19 years. Um, this included the, the appointment of the deputy chairman of the board, who would, who, who would have been the lead independent director of Steinhoff. And given his long tenureship and the established relationships that emanate as a result, this may detract from his, his ability to protect the minorities, which is the purpose of a lead independent director. Uh, in the 2017 AGM as well, we also voted against um, percentage of shares um, that, that ex to be issued because this allows us as shareholders to be engaged before material corporate actions are concluded to ensure that we are comfortable with the risks that we may identify. Uh, we voted against um, management board to limit or exclude preemption rights because as a shareholder we have to preserve the right of refusal to participate in the company's corporate actions. So following the debacle in December, um, the PIC team engaged, the PIC um, sent written correspondence to the to Steinhoff board. Uh, must, must say the Steinhoff board is very receptive and they have embraced some of the PIC's proposals. To this end, some of the key things we required was for Dr. D, Dr. Visa to step down, which he subsequently did. We've requested the appointment of at least two independent directors and to that end we have nominated, we've sent through nomination, nominee names for appointment to, to, the, board, to the company. The PIC board also represent, uh, representation on the, on the committee who's going to be tasked with investigating the Steinhoff um, um, irregularities because we require that process to be transparent and in keeping with the, with the request from our client, the GPF. The block to, on the top left-hand side um, reflects some of the ESG engagements that have predated the Viceroy expose. And given the recurring nature of most of these uh, matters, we do believe that we may require regulation to drive the behaviors in the desired direction. The PIC will continue to engage in these and to that end we are also participating in collaborative engagements with um, other South African asset managers. These, the various letters and replies have been sent to Steinhoff which have been acknowledged and, and, and responded upon by the Steinhoff board. We've also engaged the JSE and this will be an ongoing engagement um, going forward. Some of the aspects we require to be amended or to be engaged on, we require, when we start looking at the tenure and the relationships of directorships, an aspect that needs to be addressed is the dominant personalities of CEOs or board members. And we need to formalize the management here of, so that it becomes part of a board's responsibility to deal with this, so that there's always a maintenance of a balance of power. And we then have to use the shareholder activism, activism forums as a means to keep this power in check and to test actually whether it's actually working. What is also critical is, is an inclusive board nomination process. We need to link this to a transparent um, process where all names for, for potential board members are actually publicized and shareholders actually have the opportunity to vote on each nominee. It's not just at um, when you come to an AGM and then you actually vote on the re-election of existing board members for a continued term. With regard to the secondary listings, uh, we need to contemplate the imposition and regulation of more stringent requirements to apply to a company where there's a due listing, as well as the monitoring as far as possible and practical for it to be done. 
So the example would, in this instance would be that there was no social and ethics committee in Steinhoff. So in instances perhaps where um, your secondary um, domicilium might have something far more stringent, it should actually be adopted as part of the primary listing procedures as well for a company to abide by. We need to relook at the voting pool arrangements. Um, the JSC currently regulates companies acting in concert, and we need to have a link to the personal shareholding, for instance, where you have large blocks of family shareholdings um, in entities, so regulate the arrangements around that as well to make sure that it's also not acting in, con in concert to ensure that there's good governance at all instances. And I'll hand over to Dr. Dan, thank you. Uh, the earlier, uh, I think the standoff showed the governance structure in, uh, uh, I think, in Frankfurt or it's, it's in the Netherlands, I think, that there's a two tier board where you have the advisory board as well as the management board. Now, we worry about the delegation because from what we can see, or what we know has happened, it appears as if the management board seems to have a lot of authority or uh, high levels of delegated powers to execute. This is something that uh, probably uh, uh, Steinhoff will have to tell us, you know, the relation, what is the level of delegated authority, you know, because that may have may actually be the problem in the sense that management has so much power and you have a, a character such as the CEO, you know, that they will be able to exploit those kind of powers and conceal a lot of information that has to go to advisory board. So something that we need to uh, understand deeper as well. In terms of the next steps, uh, PIC believes that uh, probably STAR is uh, a, a lot uh, stronger. Uh, the prospects of growth, they are much better, so we'll look at probably moving more into that to unlock further value. As we said, Steinhoff, we don't believe uh, it's worth zero. Uh, we've shown some assets and uh, therefore we'll await the uh, reports from PwC as well as uh, the auditors so that we can assess uh, the value that's left in standoff. We want to use this opportunity to improve governance, not only at standoff, but across the JSC, working with other regulators and uh, other bodies to ensure that we create rules and uh, regulations that avoid this kind of thing from happening again. As my colleague said, we would like to be represented on the board going forward, and we'd like the board to have more independent directors that will be able to look after all the shareholders' interests, especially minorities. And so we await the forensic investigation and we'll be able to uh, map our next steps insofar as this company is concerned. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, if you may switch off that mic. Right, comrades. Um, let me start with those who haven't ha said a word. Let me start uh, Kaya, and then I'll come to you, ma'am. And then I'll come to you, comrade. Let me allow the, the first three, or oh yeah, the first four, and then I'll come to you as well, comrade. So it will be one, two, three, and then and then it will be four comrades instead of three. No, no, no. Your colleagues behind you. Yeah. No, you. No, you are the first comrade. Y yes, you are the first. Right at the back. Yeah, I'm saying, the floor is yours. Yes. Oh, thank thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, I know that uh, my colleagues, when they were interrogating or discussing other presentations, at some stage they interlinked. But uh, I'll try by all means to, 
to talk to the issues presented here. Maybe start by saying um, I welcome the presentations, both presentations, because I think this presentation spoke to the issue that uh, made us to meet. It was not all over, according to me. They address issues that we wanted them to, to I, I expected them to, to address. Chairperson, my, my first question uh, is to Mdata Stoll. You spoke of some losses. And once you talk about losses, it's a, it's a negative statement. And the owners of uh, these monies that you are responsible for, the pensions, when they hear you talking about that, they start shivering. And I think at some stage we have spoken about the issue of uh, uh, public servants uh, resigning in numbers because of the uncertainty and the rumors which have been spread about their, their pensions. And um, I would like you to help me understand, according to you, what is the meaning of this? to the people right, right there who are directly affected. And maybe even go further, uh, I hope you might have a sense, even if you might not have you know, the numbers, as to the impact at which uh, this negative uh, or unfortunate situation has, 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 uh, has, has happened. To what extent, or if any, were the resignations as a result of this, because we know uh, the owners of those monies, the, 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 the public servants, the government employees who are contributing to that pension fund, uh, once they, they hear something that is tempering with their, with their, their, their monies, they will, they will take that decision. And we know the impact of the mass uh, resignations. Also, Chair, I wanted to talk to slide eight. Um, initially, I wanted to, to understand, in terms of your engagement with Steinhoff, whether do you see any possibility, slight possibility, or is there the intention from your side to withdraw uh, what could still be recovered uh, from staying off and reinvest somewhere? What? Somewhere in the slides, you have spoken to that, that there are engagements that are going on and all those things. And further said, there are lessons that you have learned and you went on on slide, eight. I don't know, it's slide eight. The round off. Oh. Okay. Um, Chair, on slide eight, you, they spoke of uh, commitments. And I'm very much interested in those commitments on slide eight. The first one that speak, spoke of a responsible investment. And the others, the other four, I will try to, to summarize and I'm, I don't know if I'll make sense when I summarize, Chair. So you have learned lessons, you are making commitments, and that's what I wanted to know. Going forward, what is it that you're going to do? And Maybe to cut, because I have so much that I wanted to talk to on these issues. They are next to my heart, because they talk about ordinary workers down there. Ugut Chairperson, Kai, nga 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 nga. What is happening? Because since morning you're talking about, like everybody doesn't know what, is, what has happened, what made us to be here. Or people could not say until investigations are done. What really happened? And this is the question that you get from the, the affected people and ordinary 
South African, they want to know our constituencies. So it will be good, Chairperson. And I, I couldn't hear anybody making a commitment as to when can we expect the, 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 the report of the investigation so that we also put it in our program to say as soon as it comes in, we must meet again and let them present those, uh, 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 I mean, let them present the, the report to us and see what we do with, this, with whatever the findings were there and the recommendations. All right. It's unfortunate, you say. You, 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 we, we may come back, uh, but the other three have also not spoken, just like you. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, there has been talk here from, from Steinhoff that they are on the path of trying to restore trust and a mention has been made um, somewhere about them having a rescue plan um, to try and recoup some of the losses. Now, I would like to know from G, uh, GPF and PIC whether Steinhoff told you that they're going to recover the money and what action is the, the uh, uh, pick taking in order to get the money back. Then I would also like to know what are you doing to restore the confidence among workers um, that you know what you are doing when you are investing their money and that their money is wisely um, and safely um, invested. I'd also like to know, um, you made mention of the fact that you are heavily invested in NASPAS and by your own admission, it would be a calamity if anything, if the same thing should have happened there. I would like to know, is there any way you can or are ensuring that your investments are safe? Um, and then lastly, I would like to know um, about the actual rand cent losses that you've suffered. You have been at pains to say that the debacle has had no implication to members because um, of the pension guarantee uh, a formula you're working with and that it's only book losses. But does it have any bearing on anything? For example, on annual increases. It cannot be that something this major happens um, and it is, it is sort of said to be book losses. Why is everybody then so upset? What is the real implications of, of what is uh, happening here? Now, if such a lot of money is wiped off your shareholding in, in one go, surely there is a hole, and I would like to know, how do you plug that hole? Is it possible? Um, to, to do that. All right. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks. Yes, yes, ma'am. No, thanks, Chair. No, let you, I'll, you'll be the last. Mm -hmm. She will speak, I'll go to the comrade and then I'll come back to you. Chairperson, that the Government Pension Administration Agency that um, has got the duty to oversee or ensure effective, uh, accountable and coherent governance of the pension funds um, uh, administration on behalf of GPF and National Treasury, that that agency together with GPF actually uh, comes to a similar hearing to the DPSA committee. I think it is quite crucial because we actually serve um, currently, I think up to the end of last year, uh, in March, uh, we had uh, uh, GEPF provided benefits to 1.2 odd million 
uh, active members and 437,000 pensioners and beneficiaries. And I think um, that committee also should have a hearing so that we can also be at the full committee at ease of what is provided. Thank you. Jay, sorry, I forgot one thing. I would also just like to ask, and pardon me if I'm ignorant, but uh, where is SARS in this whole Stein of Tobacco? Okay. Can we have that mic switched off? Yeah. Yes, comrade. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to all the present or for all the presentations. Um, I'm Wilma Neodruch and I'm a member of the Public Service C Committee. Um, my first question is, since 2015, with all of these things happening, now from uh, GEPF, I would like to know, what action have you taken since 2015? Or is it just the action from December last year um, that you took? Is there no action prior to that? Then when these things happened in December, I saw on TV that the Public Service Association, uh, a person was interviewed on TV. And now from GEPF, I would like to know what engagement happened between GEPF and the Public Service Association. You know, what, what interaction has taken place so far since the scandal broke out? Then I would also like to know the government employees pension fund. You know, it's South African. Is South Africa the only, gov the only country that we invest in or that invested from, you know, into Steinhoff? Are there other go countries whose government employees pension funds are, were also invested or is it only South Africa that was invested? And also I'm a little bit concerned the previous presentations before the two of you, the, the independent regulator for the auditors, IBA, said that the investigation can take 36 months, if I, if I looked at my interpreter correctly, can take 36 months, which is three years, which means I hope PricewaterhouseCoopers are not gonna take three years. So I would like to know from the chairs now, can this be fast-tracked? Can the investigation be fast-tracked that it doesn't take three years? I mean, our public servants are waiting. Are they going to have to wait three years to see what's happening? So I'm curious if this can, if Parliament is able to fast-track the situation with Price Waterhouse Coopers to, to do the investigation. I thank you. All right. Thank you, Comrade. Comrade Kekane. Mm. No, thanks, Chair. Mine is on page seven of the GPF. No, Chair, you are correct. In, t in terms of seniority, it must be me first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Chair. Well, on the issue of the, the, the communication strategy, because on page seven of this document, you are saying you issued, that is a press statement. Now, I just want to check whether you issued one press statement uh, th that is to the public or you also communicated that is with the stakeholders. Because my understanding is uh, there are stakeholders th that is in this sector that you need to at least communicate with. And the second question would be, going forward, how do you intend that is informing these, that, that is the, the members, or you are merely going to issue another press statement, or you are going to wait for that, that is engagements like this, that is to speak, that is to the people affected, that is on this issue. The other issue that I need clarity on is the last point that you raised on the representation on the board. You, you said you want to be represented on the board as the la largest investor. I just want to check as to, is it just a wish or have you made representation that is to stay off on this issue? Because it is very important and in your presentation, 
you indicated a number of serious that is decisions and obviously they need you to be represented that is in the board so that you can influence that is some of those decisions if you can just give us that is an update as to how far are you in terms of that important point thank you all right comrades we'll start uh, here and then and then go this way comrade chilwane and then go to limpopo and go that way yes yeah from comrade chilwane we'll come to you Chaperson, thank you very much. Uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, we, we, we're starting here and then coming <laughs> to you. <laughs> yes, Honorable Mani. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Uh, I mean, it, it seems to me on the, the evidence presented to us from the P PIC that there are some major uh, holes in uh, the PIC's uh, investment committees uh, and the, their capacity to analyze uh, the environment because you set out uh, the action that was taken but it's there's no evidence correct me if I'm wrong of the PIC being aware or concerned or acting on the allegations of uh, fraud in the public domain prior to the bolt from the blue on uh, the 5th of December 2017. Is that correct? And if it is, why is, was that uh, so? And what do you believe needs to be done to correct that? More importantly, I want to dig into the uh, deal with, uh, with uh, Lancaster. An extraordinary 9.35 billion rand uh, loan to, as my colleague pointed out yesterday, one man, uh, Jayendra Naidu. So the first thing is, could you uh, break down the structure of Lancaster and name who exactly the BEE -E trust inside Lancaster, who exactly are the trustees and the beneficiaries of uh, the Lancaster structure? That's the first thing. The second thing is the other extraordinary, and I was sitting on the weekend uh, thinking about the numbers. The other thing about the, uh, the transaction is it's 9.35 billion. It's not 10 billion, it's not 10.1 billion. It falls just below around number 10 billion. My suspicion is, or my hypothesis is, that there, is, that there was some kind of threshold. Uh, so my question is, had this transaction been 10 billion or greater than 10 billion, uh, was there a threshold and would that transaction then have triggered a different, if you like, authorization or decision-making uh, uh, process? In other words, what I'm trying to get at, was the uh, deal structured specifically to avoid uh, uh, higher levels of uh, scrutiny? That's the first point, the second point. The third point is that the miraculous thing about the 9.35 billion rand loan, if you look at your confidential memo distributed yesterday, it somehow morphs into 10.3 billion. If you look at your uh, tables provided on page 10 and page uh, 9, uh, the loan, in fact, the loan amount is now suddenly not 9.35 billion, it's 10.335 uh, billion. How do you explain that? Then the other extraordinary thing about this transaction is that the proposition was uh, that this was a, tr a transaction, a black economic empowerment transaction to uh, uh, promote uh, black participation in the, in, in the economy uh, in a company whose business strategy was to list on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange and externalize itself to Europe. Could you please explain? It's a very ambitious uh, black economic empowerment strategy, presumably extending uh, to Germany and Holland. I wonder if you could explain uh, that. Then uh, another factor, it appears that there were 
uh, quite extraordinary <laughs> levels of underwriting fees. I should probably imagine, uh, if I'm, if, and please correct me if I'm wrong, of over 200 million rand played, uh, paid uh, to, to Lancaster. Uh, I'm not sure if that's correct, but if it is correct, uh, what was the underwriting fee, to whom what it, was it paid, uh, what happened to, uh, to that uh, money? All right. Then Mr. just Randall. the last question, sure. or the second last question. The effect of um, giving City Press a, a block, uh, City Press, City Bank, a block of Steinhoff shares, I think of up to 50,000 shares, that presumably would have diluted uh, your representation uh, um, at the AGM of, of the PIC, is that right? The second last question, uh, does the name Nana Sal uh, and a company called African Capital Works, which is uh, based in London. Does that ring a bell in relation to this transaction? Um, last question, right. Chair. You mentioned the, the nominees uh, to the Steinhoff board. What are the names of the nominees okay. of the PIC to the Steinhoff board? Thank you very board? much. Yes, comrade. <laughs> it, uh, no, no, no. Honorable right, Minera, no, no, continue, continue. <laughs> Chair. Uh, having said that, Chair, uh, probably let me just build on, on Honorable Kekana's question, and I believe that Jeep will also remember that at a portfolio committee level we raised this issue, that please do take care of your communication vehicles. Can you just pull the, the mic closer okay. to you? Yes. One, without repeating. Can we ensure that without responding now, your communication vehicles talk to all your clients? that you say this, because I could see that there's a, a, always a, 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 a deliberate ignoring that point in terms of improvement. Chair, let me then quickly go to slide, um, oh, slide four of GIP, the last uh, uh, line in terms of the table. I just want to know 30 November 2017, then quickly to 20, 23rd January, from, uh, under the column of November 17, 2.42% and zero, which is uh, 23rd Jan 18, 2018, 0.3, which is bigger. Why I'm raising that, Chair? It could be a logic, a common sense. It's not a common sense for me, based on the presentation from the introduction of the Chair when he, he was introducing the, the presentation as it were. I would like to stop there without also amplifying on that point. May I then, secondly, check, get a confirmation, if I have been listening carefully, that... A long a projection, and what are you going to do do with that? Slide uh, 19, chair of um, PIC. Now, uh, use which I'm raising this with re in relation also uh, in conjunction with slide seven of GIP that PIC voted against. You have tabled those areas that you voted against. Can you simplify what does that mean in terms of what was carried forward? Because also I would like to establish
and the other question has been raised in terms of also what would have been triggered in terms of the reaction people wanted to collect their pension and so forth and so forth. Because you can't just say uh, everything is in good hands, you must convince me to say because this is one, two, three, noting that December and January is just less than 45 days. And I would like to say, to know that moving forward, building up on those two press statements, Chair, what are they intending to give us, South Africans' uh, assurance where I'm seated, Chair? Thank you. Thanks very much, Comrade Tobias. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Machila, you will remember the meeting in M16. I think some, somehow I'm vindicated having listened to the GEPF on issues of the shareholder mandates that you hold yeah, when I spoke about diversification. I'll, I'll, I'll try to pinpoint some of the issues that I raised then. Um, I, I, I made a comment at that time that um, the investment portfolio as it stands is very limited. It's limiting your abilities to invest and get as much shares in the market as possible. And I, I maintain that view even today. I believe um, that it shouldn't be only big corporates that take a risk to invest and make more money outside. Well, you know, this is pension money. Other people have different opinions, so they will not take the same risk that a private company might want to take. But I, I believe there's talented people. Uh, like you, you can hedge. There are very few people who have access to hedge funds in South Africa who are black, uh, who want to play in that space. But let me also speak to this. Um, the limitation of the 90% of the stock exchange being limited to South Africa, does it also mean incorporation? Should those uh, listing be only related to companies incorporated in South Africa? Because in this context, Steinhoff is not incorporated in South Africa. It might be a decision they took later, and because of your minority shares, it might have worked against you. So probably moving forward, it will speak to how then do you look at issues of incorporation, not only listing, so that when you look at incorporation, there might be companies that are incorporated in South Africa but listed outside, and who might be actually having a better performance. But now if the, the policy limits it, South African companies in terms of corporation, incorporation or listing, then it's the shareholder's problem. And, and you see, uh, I'm looking there at the back at the deputy chair. I don't know, is he falling asleep? No, he's listening. Oh. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, 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 they are the decision makers, you see. Uh, representing the main right. shareholder. Okay. Okay. He looks at me with this eyes that suggest that he missed my point. Uh, no, 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 no. The, that's okay, chair. That's okay. I'm not going to belabor. Sure. I'm, not <laughs> I'm not going to belabor the point. The second issue, uh, you were underweight, you were less than 4.2%. And in this context, you, when you look at 4.2% performance, there was also so so. 4.2%, yes, based on the slides, based on the slides. And, and, and then you juxtapose it to NASPAS that had it been NASPAS, which is 18 point something, then the impact could have been bigger. I took offense um, when we were discussing a graph that spoke to the impact, not by you, but by GPF. I, I even went to consult Zakele there at the back because I, I, I had a different perspective of what the impact, it might not be on defined benefit, but it might have been on defined contributions. Because if you look at that, if, it, if the market value depreciates from 24.1 billion to 3.1 billion, it's a loss of 21 billion to the defined contributors. So it's, 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 it's like we're playing around with figures here. It's a big impact. But I don't, it's not my responsibility to amplify that. My responsibility is to look at how do we make you overweight beyond 4.2%, given a change mandate and propositions that suggest that going forward, the type of investments and mandates that you get from the shareholder should allow you to diversify your portfolio to be able to even determine at the point, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm trying to get on. I'm, I'm not so clever. You must give me a chance.
to try and, and speak to this. You see, for instance, if a company decides to, to, to do what you refer to as script lending, and you look at long-term investments, and the benefit goes to short-term investors, how do you juggle around in that space so that you become the benefactor as and when such people decide? Because to me, it, it will speak to, I, to a point where, had I been an investigator, I'll actually interrogate each and every individual who took that type of decision. That were they not actually colluding to later be involved with companies that were able to buy in the share market? I leave it to you. On the last point, it's on the question of the total assets that's going to be looked at by PwC. What if through their auditing process they decide to undervalue the total assets of Steinhoff in terms of recovery? Do you have modalities that you, you will use your own valuators beyond the evaluators that they will have used? They will have own forensic capability. Um, I don't see Irwa. Yeah, because then it, it comes to that space where you help them to evaluate the asset base of Steinhoff in an event that they undervalued their total assets in the current conjunction. Because they can say our asset base has depreciated at 5% since in December uh, and, and mo moving forward, therefore will not be able to compensate at this level. Who protects such shareholders and investors? And, 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 and JSC, uh, uh, um, will, I don't know, I, I don't know who carries the broader mandate to be able to, to do this in this space where such things, because then if we don't curb that, it, it's going to reoccur very soon. Any company can actually, the fact that there's Viceroy who has given, who has apportioned itself this responsibility to actually do, do this, we, we, we will not even know the intentions that had it had a raw deal for it to play it, this devil's advocate to be able to expose wrongdoing, or is it intended to sh see the depreciation and the value of s assets of certain companies so that they can play into the space? I'm not that brilliant to, to think right. beyond that. Uh, okay. uh, I leave it at that. All right, thanks, Comrade Chilwan. We know time. Chairperson, thank you. I'm just going to ask two, two very pointed questions, Chairperson, just to comply. You know, comply with what the Chairpersons have been saying since morning. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to ask the, the PIC in terms of the investment made thereof. After all this, I'm not saying after all the, the scandal, but just to say after the unfortunate uh, uh, mishap that has happened, do you think are you going to have a new strategy in terms of investment? In other words, are you still going to continue on investing uh, the monies through to stay in hope? Uh, do you have a, another way that you think you can do the reinvestment. In the context that uh, you are responsible, directly or indirectly, responsible for the funds of the uh, workers who, who are your clients. The, the second uh, question is to check as well with the oversight role that you you play on Steinhoff uh, over your shareholder uh, percent. Because sitting here, I will probably think that you cannot just uh, invest money and become a shareholder, but you don't play any oversight role or monitoring so that you'll be able to see if there are any risk that you might be facing who is responsible for the oversight that you play 
for your shareholding? And how often do you check on those uh, shareholders or your meetings? I, I, I understand you said you wanted to, to have a, a board of director or something, a, a, a seat there. But as, as, as a body, you, I think you should have all those uh, committees in terms of your checking to protect your shareholder value. Thank you, Chairperson. Right, Lengwa. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Quick question. Um, the, I'm not going, let me not say allocation. Um, there's been the notion that um, the Steinhoff uh, issue was sort of detected some two years ago. I haven't heard a vehement denial of that and assuming that there isn't one and that that is fact, I would like to know from PIC and GPF, what, what was your reaction when you got those kind of news um, in terms of um, your own internal oversight, in terms of your own um, outlook, or was it just business as usual? Um, because I, I, I still cannot for the life of me except the fact to what we woke up one morning and then boom, kabam, this had happened. In the absence of any warning signs in any of the affected and interested parties and stakeholders, somebody somewhere should have raised a red flag and it would be regrettable if um, people who should have seen or people who were in positions to have detected something in one or the other from whatever vantage point they were um, interacting and dealing with Steinhoff um, didn't say anything. So I'm really in interested to hear the reaction of the GPF and PIC in terms of that when those news in one or the other, whether it's allocations or a room or whatever, when it emerged, what was your reaction? What was your response um, to it? And if you did react, who did you communicate with? And what was the response? Thanks, Jay. All right, thanks very much, Comrade Pinky Kekan. <laughs> you know, Che, and I know uh, uh, this one is out of order, but I must just say it. A nice observation that I made. You know, I, was, I now realize that when you write to the PEO of GEPF, you also write to the chair of the FSB, and probably the letter goes to one person. And this is Comrade. Uh, this Limpopo situation, right? <laughs> there's Limpopo here. Yeah, no, it's just, uh, it's just an observation I have made. <laughs> okay. But, yeah, on, on a serious note, um, I think uh, Mr. Stolle was with us here at some point when we were saying um, the issue of 1% to us is very critical. And the chair of SCOPA even said to, to us as government, Every little cent counts. Now, now, if you say uh, the one percent, uh, it's just a big value loss and all those things. It becomes a problem. I mean, for a lay person like me, because I will also ask to say annually, what is the amount that you always pay to beneficiaries? on annual basis? Does it also amount to 21 billion uh, on retirement and all those things? If it goes to that amount, it's a, it's a, it's a serious amount of money that, that people, add. of course it's their benefits, but if you start to say it's a book value loss, it, it, it becomes a problem to us because what if tomorrow Steinhoff collapses? It's, it's, it's a problem to us. And the reason why we are here, all of us, is to see how best, for lack of a better word, can you rescue some of this. Uh, I know we, we're not supposed to be uh, uh, rescuing people because of recklessness, but we have more to lose. More than 50,000 people are working here are employed by these subsidiaries. We can't allow it to collapse. And, and, I, and I think I'm, I'm going to, to, to what Dr. Den was saying. 
And if you listened to how he premised his presentation, he says the trustees acted within the legal framework. We did not bridge, is it section 28, Dr. Day? You did not bridge it. You did not also uh, bridge your investment mandate or strategy you acted within. Uh, well and good, but you know one of the things that we also see, and I, I like this presentation that you made on what the PIC voted against and how arrogant bis big business sometimes can be. Uh, the other time we raised this issue with you on this big book that says who owns who, where we're saying there's a number of activities that PIC is participating, but we are concerned that not in, not in all those activities do we have board members. So it's something that you'll also have to look at going forward. I mean, there are black professionals, there's black business council, there are so many structures where you can deploy and make sure that people do participate. But you see, what I like about what you have just disclosed to us is that you, you, you saw this thing coming that if primary listing goes to Frankfurt, you are not going to agree. And of course, disaster happened there. So uh, it's something that, and, and unfortunately, these people did not listen to, to the PIC. In my small mind, Dr. Den, uh, truth be told, we wouldn't want to see Steinhoff collapsing. You know how you can uh, play around making sure that you become probably the bigger shareholder in this thing and make sure that our people's jobs are secured but also be able to be a majority shareholder and then be able to turn things around, including issues of management and transformation in, in the whole area. So that's, that's, that's the, the appeal I want to make. But the other concern that I also pick up, how you, you deal with your empowerment activities nine billion rand to one consortium or one person, it's also another cause for concern. I'm not sure whether it's one person or one consortium, uh, nine billion rand. We're talking broad base, Dr. Den, and, and we want our people to really have an opportunity to participate in the PIC opportunities. So look at some of these things and start to, I don't think you, you have been disturbed by this Moranyana Pampiris as kiss, but I hope you heard what I said. That please, <laughs> even if those papers are disturbing you, you, but one billion rand on one consortium or one person, it's a cause for concern for us. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Dan and Abel, uh, in case you're confused, that is Pinky Kakane. That's not a daughter. She's getting younger and younger. <laughs> Every time you see her, we're still asking her how, because I want my hair back. All right. <laughs> okay, no thanks. No, because the, the, the vice chairman of uh, the board of trustees of GPF appraised us of the the broad issues of uh, GPF and the assets that it, uh, are managed externally. Uh, I want to know, do you have other managers of assets outside of the PIC? Or is the PIC ex the exclusive manager of uh, the GPF assets presently? Uh, <coughs> And two, I think this question would apply to both uh, the PIC and the GPF is that what, what is the essence of your investment policy and strategy? Where do you deploy board members and where 
do you not do that? Because I know that in, in certain areas, uh, senior executives in the PIC sit in the boards of companies where the, the, the investi companies, uh, investi corporations, on behalf of the PIC to oversee the functions of those corporations. Where do you go and where do you not go? What, 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 where is the consistency? What is the, the threshold in terms of that? And I'm raising that because there's a possibility that the major corporations in the JSE, which we are overexposed to, can be investigated at the same time. So someone can release a report on the tax practices of the top 20 listed companies in the JSE and possibly observe the same trend that defines Steinhoff. And if they crumble in the same manner in which they of crumbled, it, your value will, will be, they, you were illustrating with NASPAS now that you're overexposed in NASPAS. So if it happens on the top 10 or top 20 in the JSC, it's gonna be worse. What, mechanism, what mechanisms do you have to detect that there might be a problem here or there? I'll, I'll make some few recommendations in terms of uh, what happens. And then, th Three is on, on Project Sierra, on the Lacansta deal. Is the structure which we say holds 25% an envisaged structure or, or it was there when you advanced the loan of 9.35 billion? What, was it there? The, because you said that it's 50% PIC, 25% Jayandra Naidu alone, and then there's 25% for another structure which uh, is gonna be empowering the black retailers. Is that structure existing or you're, you're just thinking around it that at some stage there must be disposal of that 25% to that structure? I think we must get that. And, and how, uh, I, I had thought that part of your investment mandate was saying that GPF members must directly benefit. And how are, how are GPF members directly benefiting from a project? Uh, Sierra. And for what is the value exposure of uh, the GPF or PIC to STAR? What is the value of your interest in STAR uh, so that we know uh, wh wh what is uh, happening there? And the, uh, is the possibility of still dealing with the issue of the primary listing of Stainoff now in crisis because it's still listed, this primary listing is still in Frankfurt. And you had advised earlier and argued the SPIC that the primary listing should remain uh, Johannesburg. Is there a possibility now in the risky efforts to still shift the primary listing back to South Africa? Because I'm sure the Germans will not be disinvolved in terms of trying to risk staying off. Like all of us, we've got three committees of parliament, JSC, and almost all institutions in the financial services sector trying to risk one campaign or to talk about one campaign, uh, which might not happen in Germany. Germany will possibly rush for prosecution before a, a, a further inquiry on what, what, what is the, the story. And lastly, I, I, I see like a, a variety of governance issues which we say must be dealt with there. I think that there should be some degree of institutionalizing your oversight capacity over all the companies where you've got vested interests, like where you've got shares. So you should have a division, either in the GPF or in the PIC, with auditors, with accountants, who constantly report and detect risk in all these uh, corporations. Because I get a sense that the risk offices that exist in, in the PIC is mostly about assessing the risk of the deals that are about to be closed and it ends there. Without a constant assessment of where are we overexposed and where are we most likely to be exposed to danger. And uh, what value do we expect from the companies that we're investing in? So that your investment strategy and policy must not just be gambling where you throw money, you do not know how much money is gonna come back. You should at least have some degree of scientific expectation that 
if we have put 10 billion as investment in this company, this is the most likely returns that we're going to, to receive from uh, all of those companies. Those are some of the few issues that we wanted to deal with. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks. Comrade Mente? Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, firstly, uh, I'm going to go back to the Lancaster transaction. It's, it's, it's having a, a quite a lot of money. Not sure if it's an investment, a loan to be paid back, or what's happening. But what's more interesting, given the state of affairs in stain of, then PIC, the transaction you had in the, in the case that did anyone talk to you about it? Or was there anyone who tried to solicit a bribe? If so, how much was it? And who was that person? Um, secondly, Chair, PIC, you are noting, in fact, you are indicating that the position of Stainoff is not worth zero. And you are giving reasons and suggestions on what can happen in order to turn around the state of Stainoff. Did you at any stage present this to Stainoff? And what, were, what was their response in turning around Stainoff and saving it from sinking? And on the letters that you wrote to Stainoff, you are saying you asked for Dr. Visser to step down. He didn't step down. So what's going to happen next? This year. Uh, the next one is the transparency in terms of the situation that's currently happening with Stainoff. Now, Today here that they have made the work of parliament very difficult by saying, no, we are, waking, we are waiting for this legal advice. We are waiting for that to happen. We cannot say this. We are not sure about that. I assume that's the transparency that is also a problem to you. How are you going to tackle it? Because you are a shareholder, you are not us. If they are not transparent to you as a shareholder, and at the end of the day, whatever you have invested within Stainoff goes down the drain, how are you going to tackle that situation? Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Uh, Comrades, any input before we allow GPF and PIC to respond? No, thanks, uh, but to appreciate the, the presentations, Chair. Uh, on uh, PIC, the, on governance, the recommendations, and particularly the next steps, uh, what needs to be done. If uh, uh, they are more open-ended, uh, they might end up being done in December. So if we can have time frames and uh, try to zero uh, down on that because it's more uh, an urgent matter that we are, we are dealing with. Uh, thank you. Just very quickly, just one thing. Uh, we have before our committee, Standing Committee on Finance, Dan Abel and others, uh, two bills on the PIC. The one comes from a private member, as a private member's motion from the DA, and a bill, and the second one is a committee bill. Only yesterday we discussed the matter. We're looking into how we manage the process, and we want to pass this bill relatively soon. And it'll deal partly with issues of oversight and parliamentary strengthening of oversight over the PIC, while recognizing you're operating in the market, right? 
and worker representation. We know the minister has choices, but we want to make it compulsory and a whole lot of other issues related. We will send you a draft of the bill in due course. Thank you. All right. Uh, <clears throat> may we get responses? Let's uh, try to be as pointed uh, as possible so that uh, we can deal with everything. Uh, thank you, Chair. They, there's a lot of overlap uh, between the kind of answers that uh, the GPF can provide and, uh, and, and the PIC. So I just appreciate that some of the information was not detailed in the GPF presentation because they appear in the PIC presentation. So there's a lot of overlap. But I'll be brief just to attend to those methods that are pertinent to the GPF and uh, Dr. Den and his team will deal with some of the more specific issues. Um, the, 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 there was a question around uh, the losses that have that why, have been why, why, why don't you use the mic nearest to you oh, okay. so yeah. that <laughs> thank you <laughs> there, there, there was a question around uh, the losses that we we have incurred on our investment on Steinhoff. Um, it, it, uh, and again, it sounds like semantics, but we don't speak about losses per se, but depreciation because we have not realized those losses at this point in time. And, 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 and when we speak about the slide four, which shows um, what the value of our investment in Steinhoff was at different dates, it shows the, both the, 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 the rent amount, and I think there's been a comment around we use percentages to reduce the the impact, we don't. We actually show you what the rent amount is in terms of what we held at the beginning and what has happened subsequently to show you the actual effect in rent terms, but also to show you uh, what it means in terms of percentage. That addresses the issue around communication because yes, there's been a significant loss. I think Dr. Den, the last number that Dr. Den showed at this point in time was uh, 12 billion that we've lost. So if you go back to what we, what well, depreciated. If you go to look at what it was and you track it, you, what you are seeing is that although there was significant depreciation at the beginning in December, there, there's been some recovery. Of course, there hasn't been a steady line up. It, it has fluctuated, that's, that, that's the point. But we believe that that recovery, there's potential for it to become even more. So whatever value we have, we are hoping that if these issues are addressed and the, the company uh, is um, uh, well managed that we, we still have the opportunity to real, realize the values that currently um, have depreciated. That, that, that's the first thing. So public servants in, in, in are not affected directly by any of what has happened in terms of the depreciation, simply because the fund actually pays benefits in terms of um, rules and, 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 and basically the pensioners will be paid regardless. Uh, but of course, from a, from a board perspective, and from the, the committee's perspective, a representative of South African Incorporated, the taxpayers, it is very important that, of course, we do not make any losses because ultimately we'll have to go back to, 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 to government and then to taxpayers to ask for any additional money. And so far, there is no need for that to happen because the fund is very well funded, over 115% at the last valuation. So public servants and pensioners need, need not worry about their benefits at all. Of course, the trustees, uh, and you are worrying because ultimately you are responsible for the potential of the, the, the impact on the fiscus. Uh, engagement with Steinhoff, the GPF has not had any direct, direct uh, engagement with Steinhoff because that responsibility has, has been delegated to the, to the PIC. So a lot of the actions that uh, you have seen the PIC indicating are in joint, in conjunction with the GPF. So we engage with the, with the PIC, the PIC then directly engages with Steinhoff. Um, uh, lessons and, 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 and commitments, uh, responsible investing, the same issue. We, 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 we have uh, developed new investment beliefs. Uh, we are looking at uh, uh, working together with the PIC. Well, we are working with the PIC, so there's, again, a close working relationship to ensure that the asset owner and the asset manager have the same uh, views about how they actually cascade uh, ESG into the investee company. So again, th that's a lot of collaboration. It's not a question of what the GPF does because then it actually engages with the PIC who then executes. Uh, do we know what really happened? Unfortunately, we do not know. And I think that's the purpose of the investigations. Yes, I think there's some impatience to get down to the bottom of what has happened. But as has been indicated, that's why Steinhoff has appointed PWC to actually do that. 
Yes, the, 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 there's a concern it might take long. We're hoping that, of course, it will not take too long. I think Erba has indicated that although these things take about three years to, take, to, to be investigated, their target time is not three years. I think it's a lot less than that. I think they're talking about 12 months. I think they're talking about a year, um, and probably sooner. Um, uh, there was a question around Steinhoff uh, must restore lost value. Um, I think we must make a distinction between the loss value in, in the value of the share price, which has affected uh, our holding in Steinhoff, and whatever might have gone wrong. Uh, what might have gone wrong in, 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 in leading to this current situation is uh, uh, matters for investigation. And of course, if the investigation find wrongdoing, uh, action should be taken against people, and of course, they, they must be made to account. But the, the depreciation in the, in, in the share price is not something that Steinhoff pays. What we're hoping for is that because there are assets in Steinhoff that we believe still have value, that that will in time be reflected back in the share price and the value would actually go back. We don't think it will necessarily go back to where it was, but we're hoping it will be as close as possible to where it was. Uh, the issues around, uh, 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 I think the question was about NASPERS, but for us it's not only about NASPERS, it's, it's about the overexposure to uh, uh, a number of large counters on the JSE. Uh, and we are in constant conversation about how to address that. And as the chair uh, earlier indicated that there's some policy issues around that to, to deal with our exposure to uh, the listed market in the first instance, uh, because as I think uh, now, uh, yeah, I indicated, the JSE is not, it's not the only way to, to invest in South Africa. There are other ways that we can invest in South Africa. And we already do in any case in terms of uh, investing in, in, in unlisted space, but more important in, 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 in property, uh, in, in investing uh, in, 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 in government bonds and state enterprises, which then cascades to service delivery, although people don't see it that way, but that's actually what happens. So we're not only focusing on the JSE, we're in investing in other areas of the market and we, we're seeking other mechanisms to do more of the same. Um, the rents and cents, if you look at slide four, it does exactly that. It shows you what the depreciation were at different times. And the reason why it's not static is because we have not significantly changed the number of shares we're holding because we have decided not to do so. So it's not a, it's not the default position. We believe that there is value in Steinhoff and we think in time it should be realized. We may be wrong, but we don't think we are uh, because people are still going to shop at PEP and shop right checkers and people are still buying furniture. So we, our view is that we are likely to see that becoming a much different number from what it currently is at. So for we don't consider it to be a loss. Uh, the, in, the engagement of GPA, that GPA is not involved in investment at all. So, I mean, we can't tell the committee what, what they should do, but I don't think GPA can actually have a conversation, can add to that conversation. I think that's, the people that are here today are the people that I think you should hold to account. The engagement of SARS, I think that's a matter for SARS. Uh, in terms of the report in 2015, um, uh, Spanhoff did indicate, and I think Dr. Dan as well, that yes, um, the issues that were raised in 2015 were noted and actually addressed publicly. There was a sense announcement, there was an investigation, and there was also a report that came out of that to say nothing to worry about. Whether, whether that was correct or not at the time, we, don't, well, we, we might look in hindsight and have a different view. But at the time, the matter was investigated and a position was taken uh, in that regard. Um, so we, we, there was not, no action to take. Uh, engagement with the PSA, we, we have not directly as the GPF had any engagement with the PSA uh, um, at all. Um, but I do need to indicate, of course, and now this is always tricky because we do have the PSA represented at the board of the GPF. Now, when, they, when they're acting in that capacity, of course, they're not represent the PSA. But it's important to indicate that there's been, been no direct engagement between the GPF and the PSA. Uh, the issue of communication, uh, we have issued two statements. Uh, when we issue those statements, we issued the press, but we also actually make it available to our membership. But of course, the point that is made in terms of you can never communicate enough, uh, there's a whole process that I think we truly do need to engage and constantly make people understand the investments. So when, when I speak about 27, well, uh, let's say six, the, the, the 12 billion uh, depreciation vis-a-vis -vis what it represents in percentage terms, we're not saying that to, to say the one is not important or the other one is more important than the other, but it's for members to understand what it means for them because we do not want a situation where members start to take decisions because they don't understand what the impact is for them. I think there was a question that spoke about 
um, uh, so what has happened with the, in the public sector? Um, directly, I can't answer that question because we haven't kind of commissioned any investigation, but what we've seen in terms of exits, uh, especially resignations, then the actual overall number is coming down. So the indications at this point in time is that I think members have heard the message and they haven't really negatively responded to, to, to the uh, challenges of the depreciation in, in, the, in the value of the assets um, invested in, in, in um, uh, uh, Steinhoff. Uh, diversification, I think it's, it's, it, it, it's again what the chair indicated. I think there, there are policy issues there. To what extent can we diversify? Of course, we can diversify outside of the J JSE in South Africa, which we do and will continue to do. But GPF is fundamentally too big for the South African market. And I think that's an, that's an idea that needs to be uh, addressed. I know some, might, people might be uncomfortable with that. Um, and, and, and I think the private sector can invest up to 25% offshore. We, don't do, we, we, we can't do that at this point in time. I think the least that we, the GPF should do is to do so. Because what, will, what, what that will do immediately, it will address not just NASPERS, it will address the exposure to all the other big companies in South Africa. But again, I don't want to say that's the only thing because Dr. Den has been quite specific and the board supports that to say we need to look at investing in other areas within the South African um, economy other than uh, in the listed space. Uh, and then the, the, the question around uh, the DBDC, the GPF is a defined benefit fund. Um, so from a member perspective, the, the, the movement in, in, in the value of the asset of the uh, GPF, whether it's Steinhoff or any other um, uh, asset, does not directly impact on members. However, it directly impacts the, the role of the GPF as board of trustees, the, 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 the funds manager, the PIC, and of course, uh, the, the, the Minister of Finance, uh, who has to worry about the possibility of the GPF going back and asking for additional funds, and of course, that translates to more taxes. So, so, so it affects the funding level, which then impacts on the GPF having to ask for support from the, the government. And that's where the board's uh, focus is, to prevent that from happening, to ensure that we're managing the assets so that we don't have to do such a thing. Um, other managers? Uh, Dr. Den, I think uh, uh, we, uh, if you look at the, uh, the GPF's annual report, you will see, I think there are about 14 other managers that, uh, that they are managing the assets of the, um, the, the GPF. Um, that's again, is public information. It's, 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 it's in the annual financial statement. Yes, it's, it's, yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I'm, I'm asking in relation to the ones that you have directly mandated, not the ones that are sub-mandated by the PIC. That is what I'm asking, the context of the question that, have you mandated other managers directly as GPF outside of the ones that are sub-mandated by the PIC? And the answer is yes. The, the number is not as many as those that the PIC has, that the GPF has mandated via the PIC. Yeah. Uh, so, but I, 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 while I think there's a difference, it's not a very significant difference. The, the, the reality is there are other managers and a lot of them that are managing GPF's assets. Uh, the Lancaster, I think Dr. Dennis is, is better positioned to, to deal with those. Um, that, I think, broadly... Ah, the question of deploying uh, board members because the GPF and the PIC deal with that very not, not in the same way, uh, is that the GPF's position is that we do not deploy board members into uh, investee companies uh, because of the potential conflict of interest that might actually generate. But that's the GPF's position, does not necessarily align to the PIC's position. So from a GPF perspective, we do not deploy any board members or executive to serve on boards of investee companies. I, I think there was an issue around uh, how the, the drop in the share price of uh, Steinhoff is going to affect uh, uh, pension increases? Um, Dr. Den showed an interesting slide. I, 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 I did see that, but I, I thought you would address it because what, what you did uh, in one of the slides, and, and again, I don't want our, our committee members to misunderstand. We're not saying it's not significant. We're just showing the impact because, in a sense, it addresses this question. So what Dr. Den showed is, 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 is how the overall portfolio has, pe has performed before uh, uh, the depreciation, the share price of Steinhoff, and how it has performed after the depreciation of the Steinhoff. And what you are seeing, and he made an interesting observation, there's been a significant 
relatively good performance increase in the total, uh, yeah, I think it was 10.4 percent. 10, 10 10 so what, what that tells you is that, and again from where we're sitting, we're not saying that the 12 billion is a small amount of money, but we still have to look at the portfolio in totality when we make decisions. So when we make decisions, yes, Steinhoff from a daily engagement and management, we, we, we address Steinhoff, but from making big decisions like pension increases, we look at the overall portfolio. And, and, and from an overall portfolio, the fund actually, relative to what it's done in the last two years, actually is at this point in time doing quite well. And, and what uh, the, deputy, the vice chair said is that we're looking actually at giving definitely more than CPI uh, pension uh, increase and actually slightly higher than that. That's what the board, uh, on the 1st of April um, this year, the, the pension increases will not be affected by uh, Steinhoff at all. Actually, pensioners will get uh, better than CPI pension increases. Oh, there was so another question about around um, uh, the GPF being the only investor in South Africa uh, uh, on, on, in Steinhoff. Uh, in the first instance, the answer, I think um, the FSB's presentation actually addressed this matter because what they showed you is that while, while and I understand from, because you are uh, uh, the people that hold the GPF and the PS into account, so it makes total sense that you do so. Uh, you focus more on us, but actually most pension funds in South Africa are actually exposed to uh, Steinhoff, almost the same in terms of percentage, not, not in quantum, in percentage terms, almost the same level. So the exposure of the GPF as a pension fund is not the only one in South Africa. So that's the first one. And then the, there was a question around what about internationally? Um, I think the, the FSB's presentation clarified that 50% uh, of Steinhoff is actually held offshore by a whole range of entities, including some of them are banks and some of them are pension funds. So it is not just a GPF as a pension fund in South Africa no, is it just the GPF internationally that actually is exposed to Steinhoff? And the reason I think uh, earlier it was discussed that except maybe for one or two uh, uh, people who might have had issues with Steinhoff as an investment, most investors globally still believed, uh, some of them are still believe, not to the same extent, that Steinhoff is a worthy investment to make. Um, uh, uh, therefore, um, you find that Steinhoff was, was, is a share that most investors uh, actually right. still hold to this okay. day. Okay. Yeah. Chairperson, let me attempt to deal with this Lancaster issue. Lancaster is an SPV, which is owned jointly by the PIC, and that there's, there's a trust EMR for triple BEE, as well as 25% for a consortium led by Mr. Naidu. Not Mr. Naidu alone, led by Mr. Naidu. And the last time I checked, Mr. Naidu was a black person, and we thought one of the things that we do is to drive transformation. And there's a broad-based component of it, exactly. Now. We said we bought 2.75% of Steinhoff shares in creating this BE vehicle. Steinhoff is a big company. At the time when we did it, I think the market cap must have closer, must been closer to 320, if not 350 billion. Now, 2.75% will translate into something close to the 9 billion, 9.35 billion, including transaction fees that we spoke about. So there's nothing magic, there's a share price, there's a number of shares which are about 103.3 103 million shares at around 78 rents per share. We'll get you closer to this number including transaction costs. Now the security for these shares, I mean for this uh, 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 structure, are shares that are held by the PIC by and large. My colleague, Will, will probably expatiate on that. So we hold the shares as security. They are not with Mr. Naidu. The shares are in custody with the PIC as security. The structure, the funding model that we've used here 
is no different from the standard private equity model, where you will give a general partner or an investor a certain amount of money, you give them the mandate to go and deploy this money, and if they make money, they exceed certain hurdles, you start sharing in a particular proportion. The same concept has been applied here. Mr. Naidu, the BEE, are not going to get anything until they have delivered on the minimum returns that the client requires. And the returns are probably closer to equity returns because we are holding equity as security. In addition to that, they will have to give us interest on the loan that we've given to them. How did we fund this? This portfolio belongs to structured investment products. These are structures that are designed to enhance the lazy part of the portfolio. If we believe that fixed income is not going anywhere, in other words, bonds are not going to perform over the medium to long term, we will want to enhance those return by creating structures that protect capital and allow some yield, whether it's through equities or, or properties or whatever it is. In this instance, we bought into Steinhoff because it showed potential and so on. We didn't know other things. We're not as clever as viceroys and so on. You know, from what, but what we, we could see was that the stock was growing very well. Uh, and uh, we did say earlier that there was growth of almost 20% you know, per annum compounded over a period of 10 years or so. That's, that's good performance before the crisis. We were underweight. So when Mr. Naidu uh, approached us with a 2.75%, we saw it as an opportunity to close the underweight position and at the same time, an, uh, an opportunity to do empowerment to get somebody that can represent us on the board. He was on the board of Steinhoff shortly after we did that transaction. Another important consideration for us was that Steinhoff now is listed in Frankfurt. This is supposed to be a South African company. If these shares are sold out in the market, we lose control as South Africans. It becomes a global. So we saw that as an opportunity to also preserve the South African shareholding in the company in addition to the BE that we did. The trusts are there. They've been created already. Uh, I'm sure my colleague can, can expantiate on that. Uh, uh, Nevin, can you? Thank you, Chair and Honorable Members. Uh, yes, um, Dr. Dan is right. The trusts uh, already exist and they actually already capitalized with about 75 million rand. Uh, it's important to note that the trusts were never set up to be given to any individuals. It was always set up for social development, training, education, and as Dr. Dan earlier mentioned, for supplier development and transformation uh, in, the, in the group. So um, the trusts have already taken over the old PEPCO uh, scheme that was set up in 2007 for employees for training and development, so already busy with that, and is already looking at a couple of transactions to transform some of the suppliers in the supplier base. So, um, and so that's an ongoing development, and I can give the, the committee comfort that that will never go to specific individuals or enrich specific people. Uh, honorable member, uh, no one has solicited bribe from us. We spoke about our belief uh, that uh, the value of Steinhoff is not zero. You will argue that you may argue that we are guessing because we're still waiting for the financial reports as well as the report of investigators. But from what we can see, you know, top of the box message 
the underlying, some of the underlying assets, the properties and so on, we believe there's some value left there, you know. So unfortunately, we have to wait for the report to extend the damage. The danger is that the report may come back and say the hole is deeper, you know, where the liabilities far outstrip the assets that are available. And uh, unfortunately, that's what happens when you are an equity holder. You own a share in the company, you are the lowest in the rank. That's why it becomes very important to drive things like governance, you know, uh, uh, to ensure that the company is run properly, you know. So, um, we, we can't go beyond zero. The li limited liability, as they call it. Uh, The issue of uh, uh, Mr. Vise, I think we asked him to, to step down, which I think he did. Um, Dr. Vise stepped down on the 15th of December, 2017. The next steps, the issue of timelines, we will definitely put together the timelines so we have at least you know, a framework to which we're working towards. Nana Sao, Nana Sao is one of the black service providers. He does, uh, has done a bit of work in terms of advisory and, and other things. He's not involved in Lancaster transaction at all. I think value of uh, exposure to star, uh, my colleagues can help me out, uh, Fidelis. Uh, the total value um, is about 6.6 .6 billion, um, you know, in total at this stage. I think that's the number. For, for what percentage of it's, six, six? It's about 7%, uh, you know, between 7 and 8%. Well, let's, let's say 8%. I think we've covered uh, the questions, unless there are omissions, we would be quite happy to deal with those. Chengwa? Comment? Yes. No, Chair, just on, on the same question of Christoph, you say, I don't know if I omitted to say that. What prompted you to call for him to step down? What made you ask that he must step down? All right. I may have been answered, but I'm not sure whether I heard the response to the question I posed. We can't hear you. Oh. Speak, speak to the mic. No, sir. I am speaking to the mic, Chairperson. I'm saying that I may have been answered, but I'm not sure I heard the response. So that's what I'm saying. Ubuti wakus kumbuz. Wakalanim. Uh, my question, Chair, was insofar as the two that certain things were picked up two years ago and investigations were launched. So, Angie's one of the answer was there, but if I have it, it's fine, I'll get it through answered. Comrade Shulan. Uh, Chairperson, I've been answered, but there's just one, one it's not a follow up. I didn't hear a, a PIC talking to the issue of uh, any strategy in terms of a uh, reinvestment, if anything can go wrong, is it anything? I think on that note, I didn't hear it, but the other part there was answered. Comrade Shwam, something outstanding. The, no, yeah, is the issue on, on primary listing that, is there still a possibility of shifting the primary listing back to the JSC yeah. as initially uh, pursued by all right, okay. Uh, comrade Kekan. Chairman. No, 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 Comrade Kekan. Comrade Kekan. <laughs> Chair, oh, oh, <laughs> on the representation on the board, at what stage are they? Because <clears throat> you have indicated that you have an interest that is to serve on the board. And my question was, looking at your presentation, 
it would make sense that is for you to be represented on the, that, that is main board. At what stage are you, have you started the process or is it's just a thought from yourselves? Okay, uh, Comrade Pink, you can. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to uh, emphasize what I, I said before, that if we can see the PIC expanding on the utilization of black professionals to represent the PIC in many of their boards, because I don't get that sense, uh, including BBC and many other structures that are there, so that uh, at least we know and you are able to get feedback from time to time. Thank you, honorable members. The, um, the request was for two board seats. Four names were put forward. Steinhoff is currently under, undertaking their own internal process for vetting of the respective candidates and selecting, I think, the potential board members. Um, there was a question with regard to whether there was an audit committee. There was one. Uh, with regard to whether the resolutions carried um, in terms of the, the primary listing having moved, yes, indeed, it did. Uh, largely because our shareholding was not significant enough to stop that. In terms of our oversight role, um, we undertake continual monitoring as a shareholder. We engage in all ESG matters um, throughout the year with investee companies that, and we address on all matters that require to be addressed and to be enhanced. Um, it's an ongoing process until we, we get to a level where the objective, the desired objective is achieved. Um, Speaking to the deployment of black professionals onto the boards, the PIC ran a process, an RFP, where individuals from the public were invited to, to, part, to, to nominate themselves or submit their names for inclusion in our director database. So when we do look at the process of appointing nominees to boards, we look at the, the skill set that's required in terms of the best fit for that specific investee company as it, as it relates to listed in, um, investments. We look at our database as well and then try and find a, a fit and best fit that we can then put forward for the respective boards. Um, there was also a question with regard to where do we go, where do we not go. So when we look at listed um, investee companies, PIC employees are not allowed to sit on those boards within South Africa. On the unlisted side, because we buy into a particular strategy, we have an expectation that the nominees that we then send to those boards would then be employee um, PIC employees or PIC non-executives to ensure that the strategy that we've actually bought into will be ex executed upon. Um, I think there was, a, if I may address the question in terms of the challenges as it relates to transparency and companies' resistance there too. This risk has been identified and to date, most of the investee companies generally do um, cooperate with us in terms of addressing the issues that we have. However, having addressed it, we, we are exploring um, alternatives in terms of how we can try and use legislation or perhaps the JC rules uh, or legislation to close this risk and make it mandatory that certain aspects that we, we, we deem critical have to be um, disclosed and transparent at all points. I think that has been, I don't know if I'm missing any further questions. Thank you. On the uh, investment strategy, uh, honorable member, we are not going to change the investment strategy. We are rather going to enhance it or enrich it uh, by uh, upping the game insofar as uh, uh, monitoring of uh, environmental, social, and governance issues are concerned. We have uh, built a team around that, uh, and so far it's uh, done fairly well uh, from the report that, that you, we, you got this morning around the engagements that we did, the issues that we raised. With, uh, with, uh, with the company Steinhoff, uh, you could see that there was a, a, a fair amount of proactivity from our side, but we think we can increase. The most important thing in my opening remarks was, uh, uh, I said, uh, we need to up the game in terms of governance, uh, uh, which is uh, probably the cause of the, 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 the trouble that we are seeing here. So, so uh, our, our team will, will, will be, uh, uh, capacitated more, uh, and this obvious, uh, it's again a response to uh, Honorable uh, Shibambo there on 
you know, how do we do investment? Do we have dedicated teams and so on? Yes, indeed, uh, we, uh, the investment team comprises of uh, uh, risk managers, it comprises of portfolio managers, there are analysts there, company analysts, economists, uh, within the organization, there are auditors and so on. So we have that structure. We just have to beef it up some more so that uh, it's able to cover a larger, you know, uh, investable universe that we're dealing with. All right. No, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Honorable members, I missed the question. I just thought the answer to why we requested Dr. Visa to step down because of his significant shareholding in Steinoff, as well as him being chair chairman, there's clearly a conflict of interest, hence our request. All right, uh, CEO, just, just keep your mic open. Yeah, I just have a few questions. I just want quick responses. You, you, you funded Lancaster. Was it because you were underweight or because of issues of transformation? Bo both. Both. So when we, you we, we, we could have bought the 275 in the market to close the position, but the opportunity to transform because he had already, you know, had some relationship with the, the Steinhoff, Steinhoff people. So we what saw it as an opportunity. What, what relationship? You say he already had or you already had? He already had. What, what relationship? He's been with the, the B of, of uh, Pepco for a while uh, in the in the B structure, if uh, I'm not mistaken. So he was being you know, empowered he's been again. Quite, yeah, he's so been he quite involved in the, in, in the company. No, that's fine. So he was being empowered again by the PIC, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. All right. So the, the question of you are underweight, you then have to up your representation. Is that a principle? Is that what you do yes. generally in... Yes, in the in the other companies that uh, are indicated here uh, in your presentation, uh, like SAB, uh, Remgro, have you had such similar transactions, be it transactions to yeah. to address the issues of being underweight? Yes, it's have you? part of the the uh, investment activity. The market is dynamic, it changes every day. There are movements for various reasons. And no, 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 all no, the time we no, have to no, rebalance no, the portfolio. No, 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 I'm talking about a BE transaction to address your underweight. Because if 4.2 is, is underweight, so I would imagine that anything from 4.2 going down has exposed you to being underweight. That's why I said, is it a principle that if you are underweight, you must then enhance it to yeah. one way or the other, therefore, as you did it at Steinhoff, did you do, have you done it in all the other areas where you're underweight? We, we have a, a, a fairly sizable structured investment, uh, uh, structured investment portfolio. And most of them are driven by transformation as well as portfolio requirements, including being overweight or underweight stocks that we like and we put structures around them, the same way as we did with Lancaster. So the, the, the portfolio is, is, has got quite a, quite a number of such uh, transformation uh, transactions on the back of structured products. In, in listed real estate, uh, in... All right, no, no that's so, fine. So, so, so we've done it, it's not... No, 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 it's okay, irrespective of where it is done, I just wanted to check if the principle is indeed applied and has been applied everywhere. If I can say Sasol, what what was the BE a transaction that you did to address your underweight, or are you underweight, or you are fine? And if you are underweight, what is the BE transaction that you did? Uh, Remgro, are you underweight or are you fine? If you are underweight, is there a BE transaction T to check that the reason you are giving for staying off is a consistent one? It was not just suiting a situation. It's, it's a principle within, within the organization that you do, so I think. Chair, there's a fair amount of flexibility. You know, we, we 
we're flexible in terms of how we approach BEE. You know, uh, Sasol is Sasol, it's got its own challenges. We haven't done. All right, no, it's fine. Let's, such a let's, transaction because. No, it's fine. Let's we don't think it's the right time, was the right time to do a Sasol transaction in a situation where the oil no, price was no, under no, pressure. No, no, that's okay. My issue is underweight and overweight. That's the principle, not, not BE transaction in isolation per se because then it, it says there will be consistency in terms of uh, now. <laughs> oh. uh, Chair, I, I, I think the, 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 the simple answer to your question is an underweight position or an overweight position does not necessarily trigger a, a, a BE transaction. Right. No, that's fine. That, yeah. The, the, the point I raise it is because in relation to staying off, that was the issue that, that you put forward. That's why I'm asking, is that a principal position or not? Now, you, you, you are saying you are requesting to, to have two uh, representation in the staying off board. Did I hear you well that uh, after the Lancaster transaction, uh, Mr. Naidu became your representative in the board. That's right. So when you say two, you mean in addition to him? In, in addition to him. Yes. What was, what was the rationale of having him as your representative in the board? Familiarity with the business, uh, he has uh, a lot of experience, as I said, in the retail space, he was with the Pepco, so we saw him as a very strong fit to drive transformation in that sector. Now, Lancaster, you, you see, here in the GEPF presentation, it is called a, an SPV, a special vehicle, special purpose vehicle not that very clued on these things. It, it, does it mean that you went into a joint venture? You did not fund a, 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 a PE consortium that needed funding in order to buy shares, but you went in together as equal partners? As I said, the shareholding is 50% GPF, and we have 25% that we are earmarking for that we, 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 we are earmarking for triple BEE, and then we have 25% uh, no, no, no. for Lancaster. No, 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 my question is, your 50%, is it security or is it your equity? That is it's, a, it's our equity in the SPV. It's not. It's, it's our share of. It, it's your share, it's, yes, not, it's in, not security. We have security as the underlying shares, full value of the underlying shares. Right, uh, Citibank. Yeah, I see GEPF says, um, okay, the, the transaction was protected by the use of derivative structures. And I see in your presentation, PIC, you, you say you went to Citibank. You concluded a ratio caller. Can you just clear that term for me? It's, it's a bit unusual in my space. Yes. So that I can be able to to have a proper sense of what of what you did. Yeah. What it is is we we bought downside protection. In other words, City, you know, provided us with a put option, which is an option that we will exercise if the share price falls below the share price at which we bought in. So we protect what was that? Is that a loan? It's insurance. It's, insurance. Insurance. it's an insurance. So you pay premium for this insurance to protect the downside. In other words, the share price, if it falls below 78, then we are protected. We're not going to lose capital. How much were you we, paying and, and how much have you paid so far? Let me just finish, uh, honorable member. So there's a premium to be paid. So rather than pay a premium directly, we sold the upside. We sold them the option to buy from us 
at a higher level, at a higher uh, a, 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 a strike price, we call it, at a higher price into the future, which, if my memory serves me well, is about uh, 127 percent. So in other words, the share price can increase up to 127 percent. Then we're not going to participate uh, in the upside beyond that. For that, they paid us a premium to settle the they pay us premium for the call option to settle the premium that we should have paid for the put option. That's why we call it a ratio zero cost call. I All guess right. it's, uh, you know, uh, financial balance. We're creating some barriers to entry as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sure my... My mind is a bit on the weaker side, but um, I'll, I'll digest those uh, uh, those explanations uh, to ensure that they, they, they do make sense. <coughs> so when we talk about the exposure, uh, when we talk about the 24 billion, does it include the 9.3 billion or that is that is separate? What, what to, when you say 24 billion, we're not talking about the direct investment of PIC, yes. or does that also include this 9.3 billion? Or is this a separate exposure? Thank you, Chair. Uh, the 9.35 is a separate exposure to the 24 billion rand exposure. I'm sure we should. Because it's an exposure, I'm sure it would have been correct to have mentioned it. More so that uh, Lancaster did not pop out a cent. All the money was PIC money. I think that's, that's why the numbers are shown separately. So, so in, in, a, in, the, in the GPF presentation, we show you the direct exposure, and then we speak about Lancaster separately, and I think the PIC did the same. So maybe what you correctly say, we should have added the two, but both are presented because they're different entities. Well... Sorry, Chair, I, think uh, I just want to make a correction. Uh, apparently, sure. the 9 billion is included in the 24 billion. Just our department sits very separate from our listed department. I was assuming that it was separate, but it's included in their number of 24 billion. So it is, it is also It's included. an overall number, yes. Well, I, I think, I think uh, the, the best way should have been to, to present them separately, but present the 9.3 as an exposure because right now it is merely reported as a, a transaction, a BE transaction that mm -hmm. bought shares and it stops yeah. right there. So now if you say everything mm -hmm. has been included in, I think, uh, well, that's fine because then now we know, but I'm saying if, mm -hmm. if we didn't ask, mm -hmm. we would have assumed, you know. Shwam. I think that is very useful, Chair. I also, what the uh, Chair was I just vivid. Make a quick point of order. Just, is just that before we no, no, he's on the floor. I'll come the, to you. Anyway. What is vivid is that the numbers of the GPF and of PIC are not the same. And, and and they admit they say it's because of different time frames of of assessment in terms of by which date was the value lost and everything else. Perhaps they must reconcile that and give, and give us the latest numbers of uh, the value of uh, PIC's exposure, or GPF's exposure. That must be inclusive of the direct shares, the Lancaster, and the mandated, like the asset managers that are mandated beneath the PIC that were exposed. Like, so you must give us a total figure so that we're able to, uh, to know that this is the amount which was exposed to Stainhoff through all these measures. And then they must give us one, one, one common number because the number of GPF is totally different from what uh, uh, Dr. Dan presented. And so they must reconcile that and, and work on the lead test information so that we know Concretely, what is the level of exposure right. of, the, of the institution? Oh, okay, okay, sure. Chair, I just wanted to comment on your last exchange. Uh, I'm sure that members didn't miss uh, just how effective a cross examination of witnesses can be. Uh, it's just a pity that it's only chairpersons who are permitted to cross examine witnesses, but members of committees are, are not permitted to do the same. 
I promise you, Chair, had I had 30 minutes to cross-examine those witnesses, I would have buried Steinhoff. Yes, but you see, uh, uh, once again, I want to repeat what the law says, the law passed by this parliament. Those sort of cross-examinations take place through the appropriate authorities. Now, you cannot call a witness who's accused to the Justice Committee and cross-examine him or her because he's accused of something. It's the justice system that does that, and you hold the justice system to account. You cannot assume the responsibility of regulators you've established in law who are legally mandated. But that does not mean that we will not shape uh, a, a format that will allow more inquiries within the law. Right, thank you very much. Comrade Spinky. No, no, Chair. I think your, your questioning earlier on, on the underweight and overweight, how they were doing the BE transactions, maybe if we can ask Dr. Den just to give us policy on how they, they deal with this uh, BE transaction so that we see consistency on some of the things, especially from what uh, you were trying to to understand and how he was responding on some of these things so that we we all are at one in terms of how they deal with some of these things. All right. Um, I don't know, but let me allow you to respond to your question. Because you see the the empty seat in that question will be beyond the theory. What is the practice? So you may get the theory, but it does not, it does not tell you anything. That is why when you have a, 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 a particular case, you then try and say, yeah, but uh, I can allow him to, to maybe briefly talk to that and say, this is how we, we approach it and this is how we do it. Chair, I think we can, we can share the B policy with, her, with the honorable member. We do have a B policy. All right. Um, comrades, I think we might have finally come to the conclusion of uh, today's engagement. And I just want to, to thank you, comrades, uh, first and foremost, for staying the course and uh, mm -hmm. and really engaging uh, and thankfully over engaging uh, it would have been the worst case if you all had no questions it is better for you to have more questions and to suppress you than than for people to come make presentations and and there's no engagement i do want to say from our side and hopefully we can carry this through we we think today was a preliminary engagement. Identify, isolate the issues uh, for purpose of further engagement so that we can be, will be more pointed and, and more focused in our, you know, in our thrust. And yet today, we, we did not know. We had read a lot of things. We needed to hear from, from the horse's mouth, uh, not just as horses, but from the horse's mouth. Uh, what exactly has happened, uh, so that we can then form a, a, a picture. And based on that picture, we can then engage further. And I'm sure comrades will have even more time uh, because we'll have narrowed down rather than to be everywhere. I also want to thank uh, our state uh, institutions uh, that we invited who have come and we have made presentations um, it is our duty and responsibility to ask you questions. And those questions must be seen as opportunities to clarify uh, so that we can understand better, but also the public can know better. And also to welcome and thank uh, Steinhoff. I definitely don't wish to be in your, in your shoes uh, at all. <laughs> Uh, in as much as I'm very upset with uh, what has happened, but <laughs> seeing you people seated here, I don't wish to be in your shoes, but good luck. Uh, yeah, sure. what, what we want, and I think that's what we said at the beginning, uh, we want 
your, your cooperation, your own initiative and efforts to ensure that uh, what went wrong is exposed. We all know what, is, what went wrong. We all know who did wrong so that those people can be held accountable. Um, it is in your own interest because you still want to trade. So one of the best ways of saving your reputation is to be seen to be cleaning house. And uh, this platform and the various uh, institutions that are there are actually assisting you to identify those individuals. We want them to be held accountable so that the outrage that society expresses against a, a fraud, against a greed, against corruption, uh, must not be seen to be limited, but it must be holistic. Uh, because after all, uh, the morality uh, in, in, in all the sectors impact on everybody and on everything. And the kind of image that uh, is presented of our country and, 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 and its state of governance at all levels uh, is impacted by all these things. So we, we, we would want and we hope that beyond your engagement with PwC tomorrow, we can start to have some roadmap uh, that can assist us in terms of how soonest we could get to the bottom uh, of, uh, of these issues. We certainly would want to still engage with you um, and walk this journey with you because Parliament cannot, cannot be a spectator. Uh, on these matters that uh, impact very, very negatively and very, very fundamentally uh, on the country. So we would want to do that. I think the issue of your former CEO and your former CFO who are not here, I think we will decide what we want to do. We have sent you invitations because that is the general practice in, in South Africa. But I'm sure you saw what happened to Transnet last week. We forced them to come. We can't do that, but that's not our starting point because it's not confrontational. But if need be, I think we'll exercise those powers. But I think that's a decision mm -hmm. uh, that we'll take in terms of uh, what, what we're going to do. Comrades, I want to thank you very much. And I want to hand over to my other comrades uh, to round of everything. Thank you. No, thanks, Chair. I think you, you have covered us. Uh, I just want to add that uh, it was not only about what has happened. It was also about what is being done after the event. And we should uh, appreciate the action uh, that uh, Steinhoff have taken now with regard to their CEO, who has been uh, reported to, to the Hawks, and I think the matter is subject for further investigation and prosecution. I think that is in line with our uh, approach or understanding that where uh, things have been done in a manner that is not in keeping with the law, the law must take its course. If there's any wrongdoing, there should be no cover up. I think the investigations that we are doing will obviously indicate who else was involved and uh, action should be taken against uh, the, the, those, those individuals. So it's important for us in terms of what you are going to do, what you have done. Obviously, you are not going to wait for the next time we interact with you. You need to take action on the things that needs to be done. And uh, you are here, uh, uh, Heath, uh, son as acting chair. And there is an acting CEO as well, which I think uh, you, you have shown uh, decisive leadership because that is what is uh, needed from that institution. And of course, from the side of government, I agree with what uh, the chair has said, you must do what you are supposed to do, particularly our FSB and other institutions that must look at the wrongdoing. Action must be taken. And of course, we commend what PIC has been doing. 
uh, in regard to utilizing the, man, the pension funds in such a manner that is uh, very productive and good for, 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 for the, uh, those who are investing their pensions in your care. And also you are re emphasis that uh, people's pensions is guaranteed, uh, Chief, because it's important that uh, employees must know that uh, they will get their pensions because if we don't communicate that properly, they will be queuing there wanting their pensions tomorrow. And that can be a very serious, uh, serious matter. So I think, yeah, just to, to add my word to what has been said with regard to what has been done. We are on the right track. We must just continue to do the good work. It's good for the country. It's good for everybody. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just very quickly, two minutes. One is that uh, we still should stick by what we agree. See, elements of a strategy and program, comrades, have already emerged. I entirely agree. It's there. What we will do is the three chairs uh, will, will prepare a document, uh, say, within 10 days or so, two weeks, uh, uh, which will be like setting out the overall strategy, the program. We will consult with the Trade and Industry Committee in the first instance. So if it goes about 14 days, we will send it to you and then we'll discuss it and we'll find some format. Secondly, I think we should still hold by this. There are many questions that are not fully answered. Can you please, by Monday, 12 o'clock, send it to Zakele Eshlope or Alan Wickham, who will coordinate it, and then we will send it to them. If there are further questions you want to add, let me remind you, you've got till Monday, 12 o'clock. The researchers will also add questions. Right, so please do that, and then we'll give you 10 days to reply. Then the other quick thing is that uh, I would like to personally, uh, coordinating three committees and three chairs during the constituency period with all the upheavals, coming back to Parliament in the first full week of Parliament, as it were, was not easy. However, I want to thank the two comrades for concerted cooperation. And actually, while we have different traditions and oversight cultures, the three committees, and the way the three chairs manage, there's a remarkable synergy between our overall approaches. And in exchanges here, uh, uh, Nattering, actually we're quite struck by how similar, uh, ultimately, uh, we are about you know, the perspectives. Finally, I want to thank you also, comrades who are chairing, for managing Tandi Tobias Pakola so well. <laughs> and I want to remind everybody that when we're having a standing committee on finance, the chair has a right, they don't allow me to, to say to somebody, you've spoken for 22 minutes, can you please stop? They get really angry. Why don't they get angry with the other chairs? <laughs> right, so Zakele, do some work on that. Then the next thing I want to tell you, comrades, the final thing, the most important thing I can say. Those of you who have access to Radio Mongolia, or the Senegal Times, or the uh, Buenos Aires TV, you will see a statement that was issued last night by a certain member of this committee that says, the hearings were a sham. They were shambolic. They were dysfunctional. I told them so. I told them. They wouldn't listen to me. And then you're going to get the La Paz TV contact. Mr. Karim, can you respond? You will respond? You will respond. I've got better things to do in life. The Senegal Times, speaking in French, will contact me in French and say, Mr. Karim, uh, can you please respond to the statement by a certain person? Look, I have a life. Remember? Yo, thank you very much. Bye, everybody.